Uh, there are no apologies. Agenda item one is a decision uh, to take item four, consideration of a proposal to commission research in private today. Are we all agreed? agreed. Are all agreed. Now I'm going to suspend briefly to allow our witnesses um, to take their positions. Not all of them have arrived yet. Agenda item one is our third evidence session. Uh, agenda item two, rather, is our third, uh, third evidence session on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is private paper. And I welcome our first panel, uh, Kenny Donnelly, Procurator Fiscal High Court, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Dorothy Bain QC, Faculty of Advocates, Grazia, Grazia Robertson, uh, Criminal Law Committee, the Law Society of Scotland, and Ewan McElvride, Casework Team, Miscarriages of Justice Organisation Scotland. And can I again thank the witnesses, as we do every week, for taking the time and trouble to give us written submissions, which help us tremendously in advance of the formal evidence session. Um, we now move straight to questions from members, starting with Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, can I start just by sort of generally opening up the discussion with what you perceive to be the benefits of pre-recorded evidence, for example, in terms of the impact on vulnerable witnesses and the quality of evidence um, that might be given, and then any um, downside that you see um, to, to this uh, method of, of taking evidence, and whoever would like to, to start. Okay. Looks, like, yes. looks like I'm here. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I mean, the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service welcome the introduction of the bill. Uh, there are a number of benefits. Our professional experience supports the view that a greater use of pre-recorded evidence will have significant benefits to victims and witnesses. As has been noted in many of the written responses to the committee, it will reduce the risk of further traumatisation of victims and witnesses and will <coughs> also help to ensure that evidence is taken as close as possible to the point in time at which an allegation is made. It will allow children and vulnerable adults to give their evidence out with the presence of a jury, which itself can be a challenging environment uh, for anyone appearing in court. There are clear benefits on that basis, and, and we welcome the, that the Bill uh, allows that opportunity to assist victims and witnesses to give their best evidence. Pre-recording of the evidence of witnesses will most effectively be achieved by employing a combination of special measures uh, and contained in Section 271M, namely giving evidence in the form of ev a prior statement as the evidence in chief, and secondly, taking the evidence by commissioner. A high quality uh, visual and audio recording of a police interview is required to enable the first part of that to be effective. The quality has to be there in both the recording and in terms of the questions which are asked. Once that's achieved, that allows us to use that evidence in the first instance to avoid having the witness to go through all of their evidence in its entirety. We can't always do that at the moment because the, the quality of the recording equipment isn't always consistent and so the quality of the recording we get can often be difficult and distracting or simply not capable of being played in a courtroom. Um, one of, one of the challenges is ensuring that that recording is, is capable of being heard in, in what are quite big mm -hmm. environments in many of our courts. Sorry, can I just interject? How often does, does that happen? Is that a fairly regular occurrence? Uh, uh, sadly, more often than I would like to be the case. I don't have anything mm -hmm. other know, than anecdote. Uh -huh. um, but uh -huh. it's certainly something which arises um, reasonably frequently in terms of the, the recording equipment. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's affected both by the, the equipment itself and then the, the environment in which it's uh -huh. deployed. Um, sometimes the recording um, equipment itself is not the fault, but people maybe flicking papers at their, at their own points of the interviews and such like can, can or, or simply where the, where the equipment's positioned 
in terms of the microphone and, and the ability of the witness then to, to have their, their voice captured. You're talking, particularly in the case of children, about really um, sometimes very softly spoken um, evidence, evidence softly spoken in the best of times, but talking about very sensitive matters. Um, it can be difficult unless the equipment is, is correctly set up and is of sufficient quality for the recording to be effective. The second part of it is in the quality of the questioning. Uh, police and social workers, in, in the case of the joint investigative interviews of children, are trained in the conducting of these interviews, but there are times when, as a matter of law, we have to review that, and, and times when some of the questioning is not of the sufficient quality, either because something's missed or, or because a question which is asked results in something which is inadmissible, either because of the nature of the question or because of the nature of the answer. So quality in two fronts uh, has to be sorted out. Uh, but once we get that, that part of it fixed, and I know that the government have been looking at investing in additional um, equipment, and that the police and social work department have embarked on new, to revising the training mm -hmm. with a view to rolling that out across uh, the uh, officers who are trained to do that, uh, that should hopefully provide the, the framework to allow us to use the prior statement as the evidence, mm -hmm. and then the evidence by commissioner at an earlier stage to allow the victim to give their evidence in, a, in an environment which is more friendly than than the more hostile environment of a courtroom uh, and then allow that best evidence to be presented to the jury. Okay, thank you. Anyone else like to? So, uh, I would agree with what Mr Donnelly has said about the benefits of pre-recording evidence and I would also support what he said in relation to the difficulties that are currently faced with the, the quality of the recording and the equipment available and the quality of the questioning and the product that's available for the jury to see. I support all of what he says in that respect. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. rather than just adding, just saying, repeating what he has said, mm -hmm. I think another real benefit, particularly in cases involving children, is that the recording is made as near as possible to the time of the events in question. And for children particularly, who change so quickly uh, from, for example, age of 10 through to 12, in their physical demeanour, in their emotional development, in their intellectual development, it can make all the difference to a case where you have captured at the time the evidence of the child, probably when they're at their most vulnerable. So for all of those reasons, all of the reasons Mr Donnelly has said, and particularly emphasising the impact on early recording of children's evidence, the Faculty Ad of Advocates supports this bill and the reasons that underpin it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Morning. Um, I think from the point of view of the Law Society, we approach this very much um, to emphasise the, the role of the defence in, in, in all of this and the recording of evidence we, we totally accept, particularly where children are concerned, that this can be the best way to present that evidence uh, for the purposes of a trial process and we're supportive of that. We do require to test that, and we do require to test that evidence in an appropriate manner. And you'll notice from our response, I appreciate there was a lot of emphasis about resourcing and funding and the defence being properly resourced. And that wasn't simply us looking for more cash. It was a recognition that this is a big undertaking that will require a significant financial input. And if that is not in place and it is not done properly, then you're almost in a, more, a worse position than you were before because expectations have been raised mm. that this will be a better situation and it may turn out not to be so mm. for all of the reasons that have already been uh, uh, voiced before. Mm. Um, and I think we were also influenced by the fact that there is an issue at the moment with the recovery of digital evidence in other criminal court cases and the presentation of that to the defence in a format that we can use. There are obviously technical issues um, already in existence and our concern is if they are not being properly addressed what will happen when this system is brought into play if everything isn't just on point as regards the quality of the equipment and the, if all elements of it are properly resourced down to the, the people who are uh, putting the questions to the children, their training, almost to every aspect of this there's a financial imperative that has to be dealt with. When you said um, test, you're required to test it, what, can you maybe expand on that? Do you mean by phasing it in on a slower 
fashion? Or I, I was actually just meaning the defence having the opportunity to, um, to, to challenge any evidence as they have to do in a criminal court setting. We have to um, have an opportunity perhaps to have certain questions put to witnesses. That's all something that is already being done. Um, but if that's going to become a, a more common practice, um, then... We, we, we just want our membership, our solicitors, to, to be assured that there is appropriate legal aid funding in place for us to do that at the, the correct opportunity in the proceedings, not too soon, not too late, and that we don't encounter difficulties in that, which cause further delay in the process, because one of these issues that was highlighted, that this should make the matter a bit more smooth running, and it should hopefully avoid longer delays in getting these cases to mm -hmm. a, a court conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was in relation to that, but also the, the, the issue of, of, of phasing this in slowly was something that I think we felt very strongly about that, that to, to rush into this process could create great difficulties. And that's why we were fully in favour of focusing, first of all, on younger children, serious offences, bringing it in there and testing and evaluating it, not just simply starting with that and then moving on, but evaluating how that element of the process works is there something that can be changed? Can we learn from that before moving on to other elements? Because you will be obviously under pressure from various agencies speaking on behalf of people who say, why not us? We want this to come in sooner. We want this to be available to other witnesses. So there is a, a pressure to move along more quickly than perhaps might be wise. And would you have a particular time scale in mind that you think would be reasonable to suggest? I, I think there are probably others better uh, mm. versed to, to suggest something like that. But I think until we are assured that this, the, the, the new procedure is working well in respect of the gathering of evidence of children in serious matters, we shouldn't be considering rolling it out to any other um, categories of witness. Okay, thank you. Mr McElroy. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, from the outset, we, 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 we accept the rationale behind the taking of evidence from child witnesses in this way. Uh, we can see how that can be beneficial and appropriate. We, however, my organisation, however, comes at this from a slightly different perspective in that we represent people for whom the trial process has already gone wrong and we see quite a lot of devil in the detail. Uh, if I can boil it down to the two principal problems that we have, we see an imbalance in the separate treatment of vulnerable witnesses and complainers as against vulnerable accused. And I note from the policy uh, memorandum that we had a look at that there is recognition that similar measures in the interest of fairness might be better to be put in place for vulnerable accused also. It's recognised that there may be a need for that and therefore it seems to us surprising that we would be proposing to proceed with legislation which is by definition unbalanced in that way. We would have thought it might have been better to iron out the approach to vulnerable accused at the same time and then introduce it all at the one time. That's just as a general observation. The other difficulty we have is with the uh, concept of the deeming of witnesses to be vulnerable, particularly where they, there is no apparent objective standard of actual vulnerability. Uh, and we, uh, we take that to constitute a threat to the trial process in that a witness who, or a complainer who is deemed to be vulnerable will derive some advantage in terms of credibility in the eyes of a jury. That we see as a problem. Can I ask you specifically with regard to children? Um, do you have any misgivings about that? I, I... No, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I speak from personal experience. I, probably uniquely on this panel, um, have been uh, cross-examined as an accused person in the High Court myself. I underwent six days of cross-examination, found the experience very unpleasant. I understand that it's for everyone a very difficult and, tr and stressful uh, experience. And I think in terms of preserving the quality of evidence, particularly from children, I mean, I, I, I have no problem whatever with the proposal in general in that sense. And on the principle of innocent before guilty, do you not think that, you know, for the child accused to be giving evidence before you know, any, anything, is that not detrimental to them? I, I, it, it may be. I mean, there's obviously quite a lot of work needs to be done in this, and that, in a sense, is my point. I don't think it's really been properly examined. There are issues, obviously, in that an accused person is in a different situation to everyone else and would normally be given their evidence at a different stage. But if we recognise that there are dangerous or um, negative impacts on vulnerable witnesses, 
in giving evidence in the high pressure environment of the High Court or the Sheriff Court and it's on procedure or whatever, uh, then we really need to be recognising that that cuts both ways. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and to follow on from possible um, problems with miscarriages of justice, Liam. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> if I can stay with you, you and Michael Wright, uh, the, the uh, submissions that uh, your organisation has made, um, quite rightly in my view, flag up, let's be cautious before we do anything, just in case there is an added risk of miscarriages of justice. And you say that there's a risk of diluting the right of the accused to a fair trial through these reforms. Can you explain to me uh, how, uh, not in terms of the imbalance, I, I understand the point you're making, but I, I think from your evidence you're flagging there is an increased risk of miscarriages of justice taking place as a result of these reforms. How? What is, what is lost? Well, I think if you are looking at deeming witnesses to be vulnerable on a blanket basis just by, by, by virtue of the nature of the offence charged, there is a danger there. The, as we see it, the, um, the, the deeming of a witness or a complainer, and particularly we're concerned about complainers as being uh, vulnerable, and the provision of special measures for them will give them a status in the eyes of jurors, which is an advantage, I would think, in an adversarial situation. There will be some support offered to their credibility, I think, in that situation. Um, have you any evidence for that? I have the testimony of a number of clients of our organisation who have been convicted on the evidence of uh, false witnesses who were given protection of the existing sort in the course of their trials. I mean, I don't for a moment suggest that every complainer is a false complainer, but there are some who are. And to uh, enhance the credibility or the um, impact, if you like, of their evidence by, by virtue simply of the nature of the offence charged is, I think, inherently dangerous. I understand. So, just if I might reflect back, so it, it's the by the taking of the evidence of the vulnerable witness as defined uh, in advance, if you like, that, that that could prejudice because of the credibility issue that could prejudice the the jury against. Well, the I think juries are are going to be. Uh subject to a heightened sense of sensibility to that and perhaps a heightened sense of sympathy for a witness in that position. Someone who is, ident is identified as being vulnerable, I think, will derive an advantage from that. I understand. Grazia Robertson, if I might come to you, the Law Society don't raise this specific point. Uh, does that mean that the Law Society doesn't think that it's a, a realistic point? Or... Uh, well, what? the issue of vulnerable witnesses is really something that's now settled in legislation. I mean, we did make representations when that was all an issue, that um, it was a very wide category of what someone um, is deemed vulnerable. And also, um, at that stage, there was a provision where you could consider yourself vulnerable just by virtue of the fact of, of, of being a little nervous in court. And if you if you felt you were vulnerable, an application could be made for special measures. Um, so it, it was a, certainly a very wide category when it was introduced. I think that's really now settled. And but is you and can avoid Michael Wright's point about credibility, does that stand? Well, jurors are, are given instructions um, when special measures are rolled into court that are, you know, they're advised this is happening, this is just to make the witness feel more comfortable, you know, don't read anything into it, you know, in, in terms they're told that. And it's now become quite common to have these special measures. So it's difficult without formal assessment to know what impact that's having on jurors. We all kind of form views as to what we think jurors may be thinking or what they might be perceiving in certain situations, but the reality is we don't really know. Um, and sometimes we can imagine they're forming a view when perhaps they're not. So it is a little unclear, but I certainly have sympathy for the, the, the view of the, the, the status of vulnerable accused, and we attempt various special measures to ensure that accused persons are supported properly in the trial process. But again, that's all largely unevaluated, and we're not entirely clear how successful those special measures for accused persons are. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the, the existing special measures, I don't know if there's been a great deal of proper monitoring and evaluation of how successful the existing special measures are, how well they're working. Um, clearly, if we're considering bringing in something else, 
it tends to imply that perhaps the existing special measures have failed in some way, but I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. That's interesting. Dorothy Bain QC, if I might move to you, um, the, the faculty suggest in their submission that there's a need to safeguard against miscarriages of justice. Uh, so I take from that that the faculty is conceding that it could happen as a result of these changes. There, there could, perhaps Mr McElroy is right, that there's an increased risk of uh, miscarriages of justice. So I'd be interested in the faculty's view on that. Uh, your evidence then goes on to suggest that sufficient safeguards are required to ensure that there aren't miscarriages of justice. Can you help the committee understand what those sufficient safeguards might be uh, if they're not already there? So I think uh, what you're referring to is the Faculty of Advocates' general position that was stated in their response to the bill. And the Faculty of Advocates were recognising that this change, which would permit the early recording of evidence, is something that's going to substantially alter the way in which trial procedures work at present. And it's just a recognition that if you change something within the procedure and balanced processes that we have, that you need to recognise that there might be a knock-on effect on one particular party to the process. And necessary safeguards should be identified when that change of process comes about. And what the faculty envisaged was an assurance that there was full disclosure of evidence early, that there was a proper opportunity for defence counsel to prepare in response to the case that's presented against their client, and for the appropriate opportunity for cross-examination of witnesses. Uh, that would be a cross-examination that might arise falling upon, for example, simply leading a child's joint investigative interview to the police as evidence-in-chief. So what was recognised is that where you have change, you may upset what is a balanced procedure and you need to ensure that individual people who are taken up in that procedure are protected against in the sense of any miscarriage of justice. So it was just a general recognition that change brings the need to take care. But it's also very powerfully recognised by the Faculty of Advocates in their response that the vulnerability of witnesses requires the court process to be moulded around the witnesses' needs rather than the old rigid structures that we uh, are so familiar with. And the benefit of this procedure in gathering evidence as near as time and possible to the events in question is that accurate evidence is in, in gathered, uh, that is recorded, and it's there for the jury to see near to the time of the offence, rather than a jury being dependent upon seeing evidence of a child maybe two or three years after the event. Uh, if I can just press you, just so I'm absolutely clear, because the, the faculty submission says it is vital that sufficient safeguards are in place to enable the rule to operate fairly. Mm -hmm. So can you help me understand, uh, presumably those sufficient safeguards have to be in place prior to any such change happening. Yes. So has the faculty made clear what those sufficient safeguards are? Uh, and I think you listed some, and how confident are you mm. that they will be in place to enable the rule to operate fairly? Well, I suppose the, the confidence of the safeguards being in place would require to come about after understanding that the issues that we have raised as being of concern in our response are properly addressed. And the main part of our concern relates to the disclosure of evidence and ensuring that those who are coming to present an accused person's interest in proceedings are properly informed of the evidence and they're in a position to properly prepare and present their client's case. And safeguards would was one of the one of the safeguards would be to ensure that the Crown are meeting their disclosure obligations. That's, that's one. And there is a real question mark over that at the moment, and that is raised within the faculty's response. The other issue relates to the quality of the recording uh, that's been raised. Another issue relates to the manner in which vulnerable witnesses have been questioned by the police 
perhaps due to the joint investigative interview process, uh, quite often the manner of questioning is very difficult uh, issue in a trial and often uh, members of faculty have experience of um, evidence not being admissible from the joint investigative interview because the manner of questioning of the child has been inadequate. So another safeguard would be to ensure that those representing the interests of an accused had the full opportunity to consider material and prepare whatever was necessary in response to that. So there are, within a preparation phase for any trial, there are a number of issues that require to be addressed. Um, and those are just two of them, but we could easily um, list them in a written response if that would satisfy you. Uh, I think that would be a benefit, mm -hmm. just uh, if you wouldn't mind, just so we understand what the safeguards are to make sure yes, that they're being put in place. I see that it is a general statement in the introduction that was made to the response to, uh, in response to the call for evidence on the bill. And then in terms of the response, specific questions were asked that required us to address specific points, which perhaps excluded the opportunity Put for that. Put that in writing, yeah. yeah. If I could run before I bring Daniel in with his supplementary main line of questioning just to the definition of vulnerable witness. I notice, Mr McElvride, you, you mentioned that it appears to be defined in the policy memorandum in terms of the nature of the offence. Therefore, it's a blanket cover as opposed to having any objective um, or evidence-based test. Is it your position that um, children would be automatically in that vulnerable category and that for other people the objective test should most certainly be in there whether that's accused or a witness. Yes, I think, I think that's the case. I mean, I would have no problem with, with children um, invariably and automatically being deemed as qualifying for whatever the special measures were. My concern is with adult vulnerable, deemed vulnerable witnesses. Yeah, and again, just for the record, I mean, I have no difficulty whatever with protection being offered to vulnerable witnesses who are vulnerable. Absolutely, but the test should be there to actually establish There should be some test, yeah. yeah. Can I, do you mind if I just raise an issue here just in relation to the question yeah. of the proposed safeguards? Yes. I mean, I would be more confident about that if it were the case that we made any inquiry into the nature of miscarriage of justice as it has already happened. I, I, I wouldn't be confident about our being able to... If effectively design safeguards in an environment where when we do encounter miscarriage of justice, we make literally no inquiry into it at all. Mm -hmm. There is no inquiry when a, a, a miscarriage of justice is uncovered as to the nature and cause of it. The appeal court will certainly identify what the, uh, what the miscarriage of justice arises from, but there is no subsequent inquiry as to how or why that has happened. And this is in statistical terms, I accept that the number of miscarriages of justice as a percentage of the number of trials we have is not high, but it is still a very serious problem. I uh, obtained from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, last month, uh, under Freedom of Information, the statistics for the last five years in relation simply to solemn appeals, that is, appeals arising from jury trials. So, therefore, the more serious types of crime carrying the more serious types of sentence and in conviction appeals alone over the five years to 2017 the appeal court recognized 110 miscarriages of justice that's two a month it's there's, a significant there's obviously number. more uh, information i think that both uh, dorothy bain yourself suggests could be brought forward in terms of safeguards and i think the committee would be very pleased to receive that if you want to provide additional information I'd just happy, on that specific that. point, because yeah. uh, it is a very important one. Daniel? So both supplementary and mainline of questions. Yes, question, yes. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to begin by just following up on one of the, the contentions that, that, that you made, Mr. McRide. I think that the, the contention that somehow that uh, evidence given by commission would have enhanced status uh, that, that's quite a, a serious contention if, if we're, we're seeking to promote something that, that is ultimately be a, a, obtaining justice. And, and I'd just like to put a, 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 a number of points to you and just I'd be interested in, in your uh, reaction. I mean, first, first and foremost, uh, 
in terms of the concerns that have been expressed to us already, actually there's some concern that actually rather than enhancing that evidence, there was some concern that actually viewing uh, evidence uh, that, that's been pre-recorded rather than in person might actually diminish uh, the impact of, of that evidence. That has, I think, been allayed somewhat by the, the actual use of this in practice. And indeed, the second point is that the, these special measures are currently in use, and I was just wondering whether or not your insight uh, was actually borne out by the use of that as is currently standing. And then the, fin the final point is, is really this, is that I was wondering if the, the, there's actually the, the converse of this, is that actually providing uh, evidence in person uh, for, for particular people, and I would suggest children in, you know, in particular, actually their, their ability to provide good evidence is diminished by doing that in court. Surely those, those I'm just wondering how you'd address those, those points. Well, can I first explain that uh, my position in this is informed by the experience of the people that I meet on a daily basis, a number of whom have been convicted and then subsequently exonerated uh, their conviction founding on the use of witnesses being permitted special measures. Uh, now, I accept that, and I've made this point before, I accept that it is not universally the case that any witness presenting as vulnerable is necessarily not a vulnerable witness. But there is a danger, and I'd simply address the fact that there is a danger of which we have direct experience of too much weight being given to the evidence of witnesses um, who have been afforded a particular status as a vulnerable. Explain that, though. I, I, I don't really understand well, I can give why you, I can give you an example weight um, just because it was pre-recorded. Let me give you one example which is perhaps not immediately directly relevant in the sense that it has a criminal and a civil element. I have a client who was convicted of historical sexual abuse, um, went to prison, served a substantial period of time in prison, was subsequently uh, cleared at appeal and went to retrial and was acquitted. The evidence, required, the evidence um, relied upon to convict him was the evidence of a witness given special measures. His acquittal uh, is where the criminal position stands. He has been exonerated. He is, however, denied to this day the right to practice his profession because his professional body decided that the vulnerable witness was to be believed by dint of being vulnerable, and they have refused to permit him to return to his profession. Now, that is, as I say, perhaps not a, direct relevant, a directly relevant example, but it's an example of how the excessive use of reliance on a perceived uh, vulnerability has real consequences in people's lives. But that's not, so that's about the perception and the consequences rather than the method of taking the evidence itself. And in particular, if, if these are subject to ground rules hearings, if those witnesses are still subject to cross-examination, I'm, I'm still struggling to understand why the special measures in and of themselves actually enhance the evidence. Well, the, the, the perception is ultimately what the, the case is decided upon. The jury will decide it's, uh, a case, will reach its verdict on the basis of, of its perception, not only of the, of, the witness, of the evidence, but of the witness giving it. But, but what you've not explained to me is why viewing that evidence uh, uh, as a recording rather than viewing it in person actually alters the perception of that evidence. Well, as I say, I, I, I refer you merely to the examples of which I'm aware in which that has been the outcome of it. I mean, I'd be interested to see if there is any study of this as to whether it enhances or uh, detracts from the credibility of a witness. I, I can only come at this from the perception of from the perspective of the job that I do and the people yeah, I okay, work with. Okay, so I think you've acknowledged that that's a speculative view. Can I just ask um, the Law Society and the faculty whether they share any of those concerns about the altered status of the evidence on the basis of it being pre-recorded? Well, <clears throat> people have expressed views as to how they imagine jurors may perceive certain types of evidence. And certainly when um, the, the remote link uh, was used for evidence, so the witness was not in court, the witness was elsewhere, and jurors were viewing that evidence on a screen, there was some concern that that meant that the, the, the witness was at some distance and perhaps the jurors couldn't get quite a, a feel for the evidence in the same way as they might do with a witness being present in court. Um, but again, there are different views on that, and it's not really settled. I know that uh, some academics did respond to that and, and gave a, a view that there had been some study done or studies done uh, to show that jurors don't perceive or, or don't assess the witness differently depending on whether it's on a screen or whether the person is in front of them, that they don't have a difficulty with that. Again, others may have a different view. Um, um, 
as I say, we're working the basis where imagining what jurors may be perceiving in certain situations when they view that evidence. Um, but certainly, uh, jurors, in my experience, certainly try their best to, to view the evidence as carefully as possible and reach a, a verdict. And, and as much as any of us can know that, because obviously their deliberations are understandably secret. Thank you. Anything in to response add? to yeah. the suggestion that there's an enhanced status in relation to the credibility of the witness, who's had a pre-recording of their evidence, the Faculty of Advocates doesn't hold the view uh, as expressed. That's, that's useful. Um, and I've taken a bit of time, but I would just like to briefly ask about the, the, the extent, the possibility of extension to other forms of hearing, and I think in particular the Sheriff Court, where the, the bulk of you know, child witnesses will be appearing, and obviously that's not provided for in this legislation. But given that there is provision for extension by regulation, are there any concerns or thoughts that, that the panel might have about uh, the possibility of putting provision to enable that extension, albeit not immediately, and, and, and perhaps with caveat of further consultation or, or work? Would you have any concerns about that? Would those concerns be largely practical, or would there be any concerns in principle with, with, with making provision for further extension for different types of hearing? Well, at the risk of sounding procedure. just as if I'm being a grubby lawyer here, it would have to be, it would be funding and it would be financing and it would be resourcing. There are huge resource implications in extending that, both into sheriff and jury cases and into sheriff summary cases. And I would just reiterate the point previously, if it's not done properly, you know, it could be quite disastrous at the end of the day if it was implemented badly and people actually had a worse experience than they may have had by the use of the existing special measures. Yeah, it'd be interesting that the Crown Office um, supports the phased approach that's been recommended by the government. Um, it's proposed that deliberate decisions should be taken sequentially over a period of time to extend the presumption um, for additional categories of witnesses, but we can only do that in a, a phased way, um, learning as we go, so process of evaluation, review, learning as we move through each stage. And I think the Law Society are absolutely correct in highlighting that at each stage there's a resource requirement. All of this is additional. Um, each of these hearings is an extra hearing for the process. It's not absorbed anywhere else in the process. And so there is a, a, a resource requirement. I um, can understand the frustration of, of those who represent other groups looking for the rule to be implemented more widely immediately. Uh, but to implement too quickly would overwhelm the criminal justice system and cause both systemic and individual case risk. Um, I'll give you an example of, of an increase over the course of the last year since Lady Dorian's practice note was introduced. I think it was in May, 1990, May 2017, going back in time, sorry. Um, now, in the period, I've just checked my statistics here, but in the period from May 2017 to March 2018, uh, and this is only in the High Court, uh, there were an average of five evidence by commissioner applications per month. Uh, that increased to an average of 14 per month over the period of April uh, to, to August 2018. And the strain that it put on the, the system was enormous in terms of, of advocate deputy time, uh, judicial time, and I'm not so well cited on the defence position, but I'm assuming that it would have been equally taxing for counsel and solicitors instructed in the cases. Uh, it, it really um, caused a massive upsurge in work and, and, and obviously in the absence of resource. Uh, there was anecdotally some suggestion that it was causing delay rather than, than, than expedition. I don't have any data to support that, but simply trying to find the capacity to conduct the hearings in what's a relatively modest increase. Um, based on, on the government figures and the proposal in the bill, we're looking at an additional, at the moment, I think the government um, benchmark is 100 commission hearings per year for children alone in the High Court. Uh, we anticipate that's going to go up somewhere in the region of, of another 350 or so. So we're talking about going up to, to more than 40 a month um, in the High Court alone for children. That's without then extending it to vulnerable adults and without extending it to the Sheriff Court. So one step at a time allows the resourcing to be put in place for the facilities to be, to be checked and make sure that they're, that they're uh, uh, adequate and that they're sustainable. And also then, as I say, from that to learn for the rollout to the, to the wider classes of cases. It's appropriate, I think, to start with children, 
because they are the most vulnerable in our society, and to start in the High Court because those are the most serious cases and thus the most sensitive areas that the witnesses are likely to be speaking about. So the phased approach, I think, is, is the right way ahead to allow the system to cope and absorb it. I think the, the senators of the College of Justice in their um, commentary, or the, sorry, the written evidence, uh, used a phrase which I think um, I would just reiterate that um, an unsupportable surge in demand in the justice system's limited resources would be the result of, of, of a, 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 a bringing this My in on a wider isn't basis. My so much challenging that the phasing, I, I accept that and the Fair need enough. for that. It's just a question of whether or not the, the, the bill could make provision for additional future phases you know, once this is sort of proven, because at the moment we need to come back to primary legislation to extend this to the Sheriff sure. Court. Sorry, I, I hadn't picked that up. The, 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 the bill does provide for it in the Sheriff and Jury Court, but not in the, the yeah. Summary Court. Oh, sorry, I may have misunderstood your question. <laughs> um, the, um, the answer to that is uh, it's, it's a matter for the government, but that, that would have a massive resource implication right. again. Um, well, we'd need to do the calculations over, over what that would mean in terms of children and vulnerable adults or deemed vulnerable adults. Um, to, be f to, to, to be fair, in terms of um, children, in some of the cases, we endeavour not to use a child's evidence unless it's absolutely necessary um, uh, to the proof of the case. That tends to be more so in the more serious cases that you're having to, to rely on a child's evidence, but there's still a significant number of witnesses in the summary courts who are children and certainly a, a significant number who would be deemed vulnerable adults within the categories of case. Okay. I've taken a bit of time, mm -hmm. so unless any of the other panellists particularly want to answer that question, I'll... Ian you, McElroy, did you want to add something, or are you happy? No, no, I mean, subject to the comments I've made about fairness and yeah. balance, I have no problem with what's, what's okay. been said. Lee MacArthur. I, I think, Kevin Donnelly, uh, Kenny Donnelly, you might have answered this. Did, I don't think anybody dispute the additional um, workload that th this will create, and it's, it's not about, certainly not about streamlining the system, but improving the, 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 the quality of the evidence, improving the justice system as, as a result. But is there, uh, is there any way in which going down this route is likely to improve, um, I, I don't know, we heard repeatedly during our, our inquiry into the Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service, the problems created by, by churning cases, that this would this would reduce or bear down on, on those sorts of problems and therefore perhaps at some point in the, the system free up resource um, or, or, or improve the way in which the system is working at present? Of itself, not necessarily, but it's, it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. The one huge advantage of it is that it certainly reduces the impact of churn on the victim or the witness whose evidence has been given, mm -hmm. because any future delay in the proceedings will not have the victim still concerned about when, or when and where they will give their evidence. Mm -hmm. So the early capture of their evidence certainly is hugely beneficial in terms of the victim or the witness being able to, to some extent, put that aspect of, of the proceedings behind them um, and know that whilst they'll still have an interest in the outcome of the proceedings, they won't have that um, that trauma of giving evidence but still no, to face. there's no evidence from what you've seen since March um, uh, last year that while you might front load uh, quite an additional um, uh, quantity of work across the, the, the piece that actually in later stages of, uh, of a trial that that's, that's bearing dividends in terms of reducing um, problems, delay, etc. Yeah, that, that was good. I've, I've come on to that. But So the, the bill in itself is one measure which of itself doesn't do that. There's a, there's a separate piece of work that, the, that we've embarked on in, in the Crown Office with a view to reducing the overall journey times of our cases. And the idea of that um, was born of the Inspectorate Prosecution's report, which I think was November of last year or thereabouts. Uh, and one of the, the recommendations of the Inspectorate Prosecution's report, one of the observations which is accepted was that cases take too long to get from, from the point of, of charge and the point of report to the Crown to actually conclusion. Um, now, we've embarked on work to, to try and tackle that. Um, government made additional funding available um, earlier this year, I think in September, uh, and much of that will be applied uh, by us with a view to reducing the journey times. The work has already started, but the additional resource that that funding will provide will allow us to make strides in, in reducing the journey time and to bring these cases to the court at a much earlier stage. We have a programme which allows within that 
So the intention is, whilst the report related to sexual offences cases, uh, we're applying that across our caseload in the High Court with a view to bringing all of the cases back to earlier indictment and in particular prioritising those cases which involve the most vulnerable, so with particular priority over, over young children and children in general. Deemed vulnerable adults, again, most of our cases involved someone who's, who's vulnerable, and so the, the prioritisation there is simply in, in terms of trying to get those cases into the court at an earlier stage. Uh, we've already made some progress in that. The committee may recall um, during the Justice Committee inquiry and also from the Inspector of Prosecution report, uh, there was a, a reference to a, a, a backlog of, of work involved what, what's called pre-petition investigation. So these are cases which have been reported to the Crown by the police, but which a decision has not yet been made on whether or not to place the court the, case, the accused before the court. And so no petition appearance. So. Um, uh, when, uh, when we started tackling this problem, around right about October uh, 2016, there were 700 of those cases. That's now down to less than 100. So there's progress in terms of that age of profile of the cases before they get to court. And in terms of the, the court side of things, again, at the same time as we've been trying to do this, we've faced a massive increase in the number of sexual offences cases uh, that, that were being placed before the court. So in the last financial year, um, there were, we were projecting 40 per cent, I think 50 per cent, I think ultimately was around 40 per cent increase in the number of new petitions for sexual offences cases. Um, notwithstanding that, we've managed to increase the number of cases we're getting into the court and the, the age profile that we analyse as part of our, our management information of the cases we have is showing that that's coming in. It's a long process. We're not going to get there overnight, but we're starting to see the signs of progress in terms of the cases that we're getting to court being at an earlier stage than was perhaps the case when we started in the process. Probably so, moving away from the, the, the terms of the legislation. Sorry, that was so just I, to explain that, that no, I, this is a piece of work that, yeah. in terms of that wider piece of work, getting the cases indicted earlier will allow us to, to get the, the evidence captured earlier and hopefully get an earlier trial. So okay. it's, it's part of the, it's the two things hopefully running in parallel. Okay. Thank you. And we've moved on to timescales, so I'll bring Jenny in. And if the witnesses could be a bit more succinct, um, we have a limited time, and if the uh, responses tend to be as lengthy as some of the ones we've had, we won't get through all our questioning. Jenny. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a couple of questions around about the timing of commissions. Um, the committee heard last week from Children First and Bernardo's with regards to um, the time taken at the police end in terms of giving uh, evidence. So there was one case cited with a child witness uh, having to give evidence to the police 27 different times, uh, statements rather. Um, and I note also, Kenny Donnelly, in your uh, written submission for today, at the court end of things, if the accused is indicted but on charges which differ from those which have been anticipated at an earlier stage, it might be necessary to hold a further commission hearing, multiple hearings would be likely to increase rather than reduce trauma. So we have an issue here in terms of the quality of evidence and also potentially in terms of re-traumatising the witness with regard to the length of time taken. Um, I wonder, therefore, if you might have a view um, in terms of the opportunities here to expedite the process um, with regard to child witnesses. Yes, um, I think um, the, the written submission about the timing of the, the uh, commission hearing um, arises from the provision in the bill which removes the barrier from holding a commission prior to service of the indictment. Now, we welcome that uh, provision, uh, but the Crown's position remains that the majority of commission hearings will take place after service of indictment. I just refer back to the last answer I gave. The, the idea that the Crown has is not to to have the commission before the indictment, but to expedite service of the indictment to allow the um, commission to take place at the earlier stage. The provision allows, however, in some cases where we, we see that that's not going to be feasible for us to, to do it at the earlier point prior to service of the, the indictment. The, the reasons for this are, are many and varied, but the Faculty of Advocates, I'm, I'm sure, are going to disagree uh, with me, but uh, the experience in the Crown Office is that once a case is reported to the Crown, the, the investigation that the Crown uh, conducts, known as the pre-recognition process, uh, evolves. We gather the evidence. We don't get all of the evidence at the point we get a police report. We have to gather the statements. We have to gather forensic material, uh, get that analysed. We have to have analysis of, of digital devices, going back to a point that Grazia raised earlier. 
um, get the, those analysed, which often then gather medical and social work records. And the, the investigation is organic to an extent. You, you identify what you think you need, you then gather the material, you don't get it all at the one time. So again, the, the, when we receive it, we then have to assess it and assess what's material and relevant. And with what's material and relevant has to then be disclosed to the defence. Um, often, that results in further, further matters coming to light that you decide that you need to get in fairness, either in support of the Crown case or as something which is required um, because it may be relevant to the defence. So it grows as the investigation goes on. Further, as we, we examine this material and we examine the witness statements, the charges which we draft at the petition stage aren't routinely replicated in the indictment. There's often significant changes in the indictment process from what appeared in the petition. And again, in terms of informing the questioning at a commission hearing, it's important that parties know exactly what the evidence is and what the charges are to allow the questions to be properly framed and to cover uh, all of the item, the areas that the accused is likely to stand trial on. There's, there's three kind of principal risks, I think, that if you do it too early, one is that, that material is missed and you have to do a further commission. Um, and in fairness to the accused, that's absolutely right. Secondly, we could do an unnecessary commission hearing because after investigation, we may decide not to, to proceed with the charge. Uh, again, there is a, a, an attrition rate for these matters. And thirdly, if the accused is to choose to plead guilty, um, again, the commission hearing could be viewed as having been unnecessary. So the accused's opportunity to plead guilty is after service of the indictment in most cases. And so that's where we see that the majority of cases will be post-indictment, but the, the opportunity to do it in, in appropriate cases pre-indictment where that time frame can't be matched is, is helpful and appropriate. Thank you. Do the rest of the panel have a view? Well, in the Faculty of Advocates' response to the question of the timing of the Commission, that's fully explained there. Mm -hmm. And for the reasons given there, I would disagree with what Mr Donnelly has just said about the timing of the Commission requiring, for the most part, to be after the service of the indictment. Okay, thank you. Um, gracias. Yep. Response. We agreed more with uh, the, the Crown's position rather than risking uh, multiple um, engagements with the child witness. It would be better that that a more appropriate time be chosen and the best time be chosen. I think you can really only look at these provisions in terms of um, eliciting the best evidence from a witness and not traumatising the yeah. witness rather than seeing this as a mechanism for speeding up the whole process because mm -hmm. there are just far too many other variables involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of our uh, written submissions, we would prefer to see it being posted to indictment rather than petition. Yeah. In that sense, I agree with the gentleman from the Crown Office. Yeah, I suppose it's a balance. We know that it can be a disproportionate effect on a child, um, a delay of a week, a fortnight, a month, let alone two years, which uh, I think it, it can have. But equally, you want to ensure that all the evidence um, and late disclosure evidence is heard. So it's a tricky balance, but one I think that has to be negotiated. Is this that once an accused person appears on petition, the disclosure obligations of the Crown are uh, focused by statute mm -hmm. and recognition, as sure. described by Mr Donnelly, doesn't happen uh, to the same extent now. And when an accused appears on petition, great care is taken to craft the charges that appear on the petition. And just as uh, Mr Donnelly comes with a great wealth of experience from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, the Faculty of Advocates response comes with a great depth of experience of prosecution in the High Court. Mm. So it is a, an informed view, informed by very good and strong personal and uh, large elements so, of experience from the faculty. I, I think from your submission you're saying that these late disclosures should be the exception rather than the rule, but um, as things have currently worked, then perhaps the balance hasn't worked out that way and it's something that needs to be looked at. And that, if I understood you properly, then um, before indictment, really all the, the facts are already known substantively. Uh, and that would be the counter-argument. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Jenny. Yeah. Thank you. It's okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Good, good morning, panel. Um, I was wanting to, to look around the, the use of pre-recording uh, evidence as we've spoke about. 
Is there any other um, ways that you think we could uh, create better use of pre-recording? And I maybe want you sp uh, to specifically uh, reference the children's hearing system, where we heard evidence last week uh, on that from the Scottish Children's Reporter uh, Administration, where they said that they would like to see um, a marrying up of the, uh, the use through the criminal courts and through the, the children's hearing system. Sorry to interrupt. Um, the children's hearing system is a slightly different, or it should be a, a very different environment to a criminal trial setting. I mean, the whole purpose of bringing in the children's hearing system was that it wasn't a criminal trial process. Um, so I, I wouldn't have thought there would be a. So, so, so can I just say on that, just just to clarify again, it was the children's reporters uh, th themselves that, that brought that to the table last week. Uh, well, I'm afraid a, a, a I don't have much experience of the children's hearing system as a practitioner, but my understanding was that there was a more holistic approach in a children's mm. hearing environment than a criminal court setting. Um, so I would have thought there would be other mechanisms that, that the, the evidence could be elicited without it being too traumatic for a child. Yeah. I'm not aware of the evidence, um, but I'm, I'm aware that the Children's Reporters Administration are keen to, to look at what we've been doing in the criminal uh, courts to see what lessons can be learned. And I think we've certainly been sharing our experience with them of implementing the practice note and what we've been doing around um, improving how we approach evidence by commissioner hearings at, at present and you know, under the existing legislation. Um, I'm aware that they're keen to use pre-recorded evidence and I see no real barrier to the same pre-recorded evidence being used in both the children's hearing and the criminal procedure. The statements which are given to the police are used in both environments at the moment uh, as it is and so using using a video recorded ev a piece of evidence um, seems perfectly sensible but I'm no expert in the children's hearing system. Okay. So identified as to why it's of benefit to the criminal justice process exactly the same reasons can be translated to children's hearing systems so if it could be done uh, that would make sense. You know you want to, um, no? Nothing I can add to that. No. Okay, the, the, the other um, question that I've got, and we touched on it earlier about, um, a, a, you know, vulnerable accused um, a, and the, the special measures for them as well. But I want to specifically uh, ask about um, where a child uh, is accused. And it's of interest as well, because obviously the, the Criminal Age of Responsibility Bill is concurrently going through the Parliament at the same time as uh, the, the progress of this bill. So, I want to, to hear your thoughts on that, if you think that, the, um, that there should have been provision around child accused. I, I think the Crown covered this in, in some point in their written submissions at paragraph 17 and 18, but I think it's important to take due account of the age uh, and vulnerability of accused persons as, and, as well as victims and witnesses. Um, Pre-recording evidence, however, may not be the appropriate special measure for accused persons, uh, as there is, I think, a conflict with the right to silence and the, the determination as to whether or not evidence should be given uh, is made after hearing the Crown evidence. Um, two of the key benefits of pre-recording evidence are that it removes the need for the witness to attend the trial and removes the need to give evidence in the presence of the accused person. So neither of those apply to a child accused in the same way they would apply to a child witness, because the accused needs to be at the trial and, as I say, has that opportunity to, to decide whether or not to give evidence. Uh, but there's no barrier to use of other special measures uh, for an accused person where a decision is taken to lead evidence. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure that, from the Crown perspective, I can add very much. Uh, the Faculty of Advocates have made extensive reference to the accused as a vulnerable witness in response to the consultation exercise and also in response to the, the bill, and that we have a lengthy paragraph, particularly our, in our response to the consultation. These are very different issues arise for a complainer and witness in a trial as opposed to an accused. And, uh, for the reasons given, I think it makes sense that this current bill doesn't apply to vulnerable accused. And I understand the Scottish Government are currently undertaking an exercise looking at this issue, and that's to be welcomed. The Law Society, I think you can see from the response, agrees pretty much with the, the Faculty of Advocates in this. For, in the interests of our client accused, we didn't think it was a, an appropriate matter to proceed with at this stage. 
up, absolutely, if it's pre-recorded before you, you actually see how the tiles um, unfolding. Like yeah. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask the panel's views on the ground roads hearings provision in the bill and perhaps start with you Mr McElbride, um, you refer to the policy re uh, memorandum and the total lack of a definition on what ground rules actually uh, the well, well indeed, and it's a general observation. I understand that my, my perspective, and this is rather less technical than that of the other members of this panel, it just struck us as a little incongruous that there was uh, reliance placed on a hearing where there was no apparent definition of what that was to constitute and what was inside and outside the scope. I, I don't claim any knowledge or expertise in the particular specifics of that. That was a fair point. And also the permissible lines of question, it would be helpful to have a definition of permissible. I would think so, yeah. Okay. I, I know the other panels have various views. Uh, Gracie. Um, ground rules hearings, I think Dorothy probably has more experience yeah. in respect of those as they currently exist. Um, I'm not aware of any particular issues regarding how they are at present. Okay. I, I don't think there would be any particular issues. Kenny, whichever one wishes to go first. Yeah, I think I think the ground rules hearing envisages what's captured in the practice note uh, as currently matters which the court need to determine in advance of the commission hearing taking place. So Lady Dorian's practice note number one of 2017, which I'm sure the committee will have had sight of, sets out a number of factors which parties and the court need to agree in advance of a commission hearing taking place. That, that is simply a mechanism to allow the court to regulate uh, the commission hearing uh, as, in the way that best suits the needs of uh, the witness, as well as preserving the, the, the rights of the accused to a fair trial. So I think it's a wholly appropriate um, step to take, and it replicates what the practice note already requires of parties. And Dorothy. The current system, the current preliminary hearing system, is what is essentially used to permit a ground rules hearing uh, to be undertaken in relation to any particular case. Uh, and so I understand that that's working relatively smoothly, but one of the issues that the faculty raised in the response is the benefit of the ground rules hearing in the absence of intermediaries. And uh, that was an issue that we've focused on in our response and we raised the real issues to whether or not the absence of intermediaries is a problem in terms of how eventually this legislation will be uh, given effect to and whether or not it was it's practical to envisage that it will be as successful in the absence of intermediaries. Uh, I think we're going to move on to that in more detail so if no one else has anything to add on that point. Liam. Yeah, just pick up. I think you've teed me up very nicely, um, uh, Dorothy Bain. I, I, we heard last week uh, again a, a, a sort of strong level of support uh, for the role of um, the intermediaries could play in terms of making the assessment of the, the communication capabilities of, of individual uh, children and, and vulnerable witnesses. I take it from, from your written evidence that you strongly support um, inclusion within um, the legislation reference to in intermediaries, and maybe you could expand on uh, on those thoughts. Yes, so that's very much given faculty support. And the reason that underpins that, I suppose, is experience uh, from taking the evidence of children and realising that with the best of endeavours, with a great deal of preparation and a great deal of attention to detail, as a lawyer, you're not in the position of an expert witness who understands the psychological, educational, intellectual needs of a vulnerable child. It's just not the job that you're trained for. And if you have a trained expert assisting you in understanding the needs of the individual witness, then you can do what we're hoping to achieve by all of this, which is to mould the procedure around the witness's needs. And in the absence of that expert input, one could legitimately question, will we get to where we want to be? And I, that is something that uh, the faculty have raised strongly in their response. Yeah, I mean, I think it's echoed by Police Scotland in, in their uh, evidence as well. I think through even where you've got joint interviews with police and social work uh, input, there was still a feeling um, from them that, that intermediaries uh, providing that sort of expertise yeah. was, uh, would be hugely beneficial. I mean, it's an, it is an expertise, mm -hmm. and an expertise that will allow the 
child witness, the child vulnerable witness, to be given their voice. And that's what this process wants. And in the absence of that expert input, uh, no lawyer would say that they have that expertise because that's not their training. But they take on board expert input and they frame and they mould their questioning around that. Ms Robertson, would you agree with, um, with that? I, I, I have no issue about the, 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 the suggestion of intermediaries, someone to assist in the communication needs. My only caveat is that with regard to vulnerable accused, we have uh, someone called an appropriate adult who is purportedly to do the similar job and there have been significant issues and difficulties with that existing scheme of providing the appropriate degree of expertise and meaningful support in an environment and on a personal level. Um, we criminal practitioners don't find appropriate adults a particularly helpful presence in many cases and it would be unfortunate if intermediaries were uh, brought into a system and the same difficulties were encountered. So I think simply a caveat that you have to be careful that you have meaningful benefits brought by the right type of people properly um, uh, uh, of a, 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 pr a proper standard uh, to carry out that work. Caveat and sufficient to make you um, supportive uh, of uh, the idea. Dis discouraging of, of, of any suggestion that should be in the, 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 the bill itself. Um, I, I, have no, I have no problem with the, the, the idea of intermediaries, but just with the, the, the caveat, you, you need to make sure that it's done properly, for want of a better word. And as I say, history shows us that in other similar areas, it hasn't perhaps worked out as well as we had hoped. Right. Mr Donnelly, the Crown Office got a yeah, view on this? The, the potential use of intermediaries, I think, was raised by Lady Dorian in the Evidence and Procedure Review paper. And um, whilst it's not covered by this bill, it is something which I think some more work needs to be done to scope the, the benefits and, and potential benefits of, of using intermediaries. I think that's work that the government have started on separately from this bill. I may be wrong about that, but I think that's, that's correct. Um, but I think it is something we should be looking at and something we should be carefully considering. Um, but, you know, I don't think we would want to, to delay the implementation of this bill whilst that, that scoping work was going on. So I think it's something that perhaps could be looked at. Uh, separately, and and you feel there's there's no there would be no difficulty in in a sense retrofitting that that provision in in due course. Would it need a regulating um, power put into the the bill so that once the scoping well, exercise is I, completed, I, I, su I suppose that one option is to put a, an enabling provision which would allow that to be done by regulation, and the other alternative is that it's captured in a, a separate piece of legislation. Um, again, that's a, a matter for government. I I, I would imagine that. In, until the scoping is done, perhaps the enabling provision, in some views, would be um, pre uh, premature. But I, I, I don't pr profess any great um, knowledge or, or experience in that regard. I did visit the Crown Court in Liverpool recently and spoke to some of the judges. The Liverpool Crown Court is one of the pilot courts for pre-recorded evidence, and mm -hmm. uh, they talked about the use of intermediaries there. And the, the general feedback was, was very positive in terms of some of the inputs that they can provide. Mm -hmm both in terms of, of, of advice and not just to, to, to parties, but also looking at proposed questions and trying to assist in framing those in a way which best, best meets the witnesses' needs. So there's clearly something to be looked at and explored, and, and I, I would welcome that. But how it's taken forward, I think, is a matter for government. Mr. Mark O'Brien, have you got a view on It's not a matter of which I have a position, no. Yeah, uh, morning, panel. Uh, can I ask about uh, the uh, current use of appropriate special measures? Um, Ms. Robertson, you said that existing measures may have failed, and that's why we're here. Is there any attitudes or understanding among uh, criminal justice professionals that can lead to reluctance to use special measures? No, I, I wasn't meaning to give the impression that special measures may have failed, but obviously if we're considering the pre-recording of witnesses' mm -hmm. evidence, that there's an implication that all these other special measures that we've brought in perhaps haven't done what was expected of them. Um, that, that was my only observation with regard to the existing special measures. And also, I'm not entirely sure that the existing special measures have been fully monitored and evaluated as to how successful they have been to date. It may be that they have been found to be successful. Um, my own experience of them is that they generally they, t they tend to work reasonably well and, and fairly straightforwardly, but then, of course, they're not catered to my needs. 
Um, uh, but from the point of view of presenting the defence, etc., we haven't encountered uh, particular difficulties with them. But as to whether they enhance the evidence that is given, I think it would be interesting to know whether the existing special measures have been of benefit. I wonder, Mr Donnelly, we, we heard that sometimes witnesses weren't consulted. It was just presumed they would get a screen, I think that's how it's put to us. Is, is there a reluctance to apply them? I, I don't think there's a, a general reluctance to apply them, but there can be difficulties in identifying what the right special measure is. Um, and we, we do not routinely, or we should not routinely, be applying for measures without consulting with, with the victim or the witness. Um, however, when we're, we're making the applications, it can be difficult on occasions to make contact with the victim, and there are time limits for lodging the applications. So, within guidance, there are certain default applications that we look at for certain categories. I think the bill is to be welcomed insofar as it, it changes the emphasis and actually pushes parties into applying for this particular special measure in the, the categories of case and for the categories of witnesses that we're talking about, because what we've recognised and what the, the evidence procedure, procedure review recognised is that that's what's best for the victims and witnesses. So um, where, at the moment, uh, we have to persuade the court that this is the appropriate measure, the bill puts us in a position where we have to justify not using the measure. So uh, the bill, I think, is a device which enables us to, to make far better use of what's available to the best advantage of the victim and the witness. Okay, thank you. Any other panel members? Not, no. Can I then turn to the issue of training, uh, please? And, and Ms Bain, if I noted you correctly, you said uh, uh, that you would take on board uh, expert input if, if there were intermediaries involved. But also earlier in the session, you, you talked about the manner of questioning a child has sometimes been inadequate. Can you highlight what training need analysis you feel should be, or what training needs should be identified for professionals in the field, please? Yes, yeah, yeah. so just in relation to my statement that the questioning of the witness has been inadequate, uh, the import of that is that the pre-recorded evidence could not be used at the trial because elements of the evidence was inadmissible. So it's imperative that those who are questioning children in pre-recorded uh, sessions know of the rules of evidence, know of the manner in which you can elicit evidence in chief, and know uh, the parameters within which they're working. So that an under understanding that if there's a deficiency in that process, it's going to upset all of this uh, work that's being done to ensure that the victim's evidence isn't captured as near as possible to the time of the events. Now, what lawyers are very good at is taking on board change. It might not feel like that, but they really are. And if a lawyer was given expert input from, for example, an intermediary who's skilled in understanding the needs of children, skilled in their intellectual assessment and their ability to communicate, you will then have an individual who's able to tell you, as a practising lawyer, that the way in which you're framing your questions is inadequate and that you're not going to get to the truth and you're not going to elicit the evidence of the child effectively. So combining the, the um, skills that a lawyer has, which is to ensure that they know the rules of evidence and they know how to elicit evidence in chief, with that expert input, you're going to ultimately achieve the goal that you want to achieve, which is to get the witness to speak, uh, to tell what happened to them in a way that can be relied upon and in a way that the child witness is comfortable with. And that translates onto vulnerable adults with learning disabilities and the like. So the combination of training and ensuring that you know the rules of evidence alongside the input from the expert in the field, you will achieve what you want to achieve. That's what, what I meant by what I said earlier. Thank you. Mr Donnelly, where, where would you see the crown with this? In, in fairness to police and social workers, this is extremely difficult. You know, it's, it's not an easy task, notwithstanding the training. And they don't have the benefit of another party representing the accused to, 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 to object or a judge to, to overrule whatever they're saying. Um, the, the training has to be right. I mentioned earlier that sometimes we do run into difficulties with using the pre-recorded statement or the, the video-recorded interview as uh, the evidence-in-chief. That doesn't preclude us from using the evidence by commissioner. We can proceed and have both the examination-in-chief and the cross-examination recorded at the commission hearing, but our, our optimal is to use the video-recorded evidence which is given at the time. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, a police and social worker are currently reviewing the training. Um, Crown Office are inputting to that and will assist with the delivery of that training. I think as, as, if we continue to strive to improve the quality of the questioning, the concerns that have been raised by the Faculty of Advocates, I think, diminish um, once that, um, that degree of specialism and expertise evolves even further. And the, the role for judicial training? There, there, there's always a role we can, gosh, um, tell the judges they need to learn. But uh, we all, every day is a school day for all of us, isn't it? Um, I think, um, you know, making greater use of this uh, is something which I think um, judges would probably benefit from some degree of, of, of training from, whether, whether in the High Court or as we expand down to the Sheriff Court. Uh, it's something which, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing increased numbers in the High Court already, and I think that has um, highlighted some issues around some of the logistics. Um, and again, going back to what I said earlier about the resourcing and having the right facilities, not all of the courtrooms have all the right IT or, or video equipment that we require for playing certain pieces of evidence and such likes. And so there have been teething issues, which I think parties need to, to have a full open mind about what they need to have uh, prepared in advance of the hearing. So judicial training, by all means, I think this is something that would also be welcome um, by, by the judges themselves. Okay, thank you very much. No one else wanted to comment on that one. <laughs> okay, Roshona. So we've talked, uh, we've heard your views previously about the, uh, the, the principles around the uh, special measures. I just want to confirm more about the process. So in the bill, there, uh, the, it's a proposal for administrative application process, which is um, to try to reduce bureaucracy, simpl simplify the process and standardise it. I, I, I think from your written evidence, you were, um, I think, by and large, quite satisfied with that. Yes, I, I mean, the... the the, the um, simplified provision, I think, is designed to remove bureaucracy and, and hopefully um, will result in some savings for ourselves in terms of mm -hmm. the administration of drafting documentation for consideration by court. This relates only to standard special measures to which a, a victim is, and witness is entitled. Yeah. And so there's no real need for a judicial uh, consideration. It's simply about notifying parties as to what's required. So, generally speaking, yes, it was born, I think, in the, from the written submission um, of an inspector, the inspector report, again, which I've mm -hmm. referred to earlier, which highlighted that that was, it was one of their key findings rather than recommendations, but something which could be used to streamline that process. Um, whilst the, the, the bill uh, seeks to make um, the evidence by commissioner a standard special measure, the requirement of the ground rules hearings, what distinguishes that, because obviously there's a, there's a further consideration got to be given, not to granting the measure, but to actually the regulation of the, the, the commission hearing. Okay. I'm not requiring a necessary response. We are, you're satisfied uh, with, with that proposal. Um, st sticking with process and, and procedure, whether you whether the panel believes that any further action might be required to ensure that the right measures are identified for vulnerable witnesses, and we've obviously ground rules hearing aside, we've obviously heard about that. But are there any other measures beyond that that you would want to highlight? I think in every case rests on its own circumstances, which is a typical lawyer's answer. Sorry, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a, an accurate one, and in each um, case. So, for instance, when, when applying for this special measure for a, a child or otherwise vulnerable witness, there can be a combination of special measures that we have to um, apply for. So you can be looking to have the evidence by commissioner application as a special measure, the use of the prior statement as a special measure, and the use of closed circuit television so that the witness is given their evidence from a, a separate site. So in every case, we look at all of the, the, the measures that are available, we discuss them with the victim or the witness, subject to the concerns I, I mentioned earlier, sometimes that can be difficult, um, and come up with the, the right balance of different measures, which will hopefully support the witness best through their evidence, at the same time as preserving the integrity of the proceedings. And you believe the process for that is fairly, is okay in terms of the procedures for 
getting to those decisions? Yes, again, whilst we welcome the, the streamlining of mm. the initial part of the process, there, there's mechanisms for review. Again, as things get nearer the date, there can mm. be changes in circumstances or changes in the witnesses' um, desires or wishes for, for how they want to go about it. Okay. And there's, there's mechanisms within it for the court to review on the, the application of parties right up until, the, until when the hearing uh, of the evidence is given. So I think there's sufficient um, process and flexibility within the process uh, to meet the interests of justice. Okay. Uh, I want to move on to resources. And we've already touched in the evidence session on resources. A number of comments have been made. Um, I guess what I would want to hear from the panel is your response to um, the resource implications. You've covered some of that within your written evidence, uh, whether they're adequately reflected in the financial memorandum. But I think taking into account the phased approach that's proposed here, so um, clearly the resources will need to uh, match that phased approach, um, if you get what I mean. So what we're uh, talking about is the speed of change, what uh, can be achieved when and whether the resources identified will allow that speed um, and cautious approach to, to go forward. Clearly, beyond that, there would be further resource implications. What we're talking about is what the bill um, is trying to achieve rather than resources required for uh, the, the potential future changes. So um, if it would be helpful to get your, your views on the record. So uh, just in response to that, uh, the financial memorandum which was produced is a very detailed financial memorandum, more detailed than I've seen in some other bills. And the cost uh, proposals are very fully reflected. Um, really, there's not much that uh, the faculty can do to challenge those figures. And I would just say they do look thoroughly researched. And uh, for that reason, I've got nothing to say about that. What we did say in our response to the memorandum financial memorandum was that much of the assumptions that underpin that are that the current preliminary hearing system will continue to act as a ground rules hearing and that currently there are very limited extra costs uh, apportioned for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the Scottish Legal Aid Board. And if it is to be the case that this uh, procedure is to be brought into effect to ensure that evidence is captured at nearest a time as possible, then that links in with what the Faculty of Advocates are saying, which is that these procedures shouldn't be taking place after the service of the indictment. And if that's right, you're not going to have the opportunity for the preliminary hearing system to work as a ground rules hearing. So you will have an extra hearing and there may be financial consequences for that. Separately, the stepped process that this bill envisages for the introduction of these measures is to be commended. Uh, step change is necessary in this particular uh, legislative change and financial analysis of that step change is what is required after we see how this procedure beds down and what the, the ongoing evaluation yes, very of much. the impact and whether or not there's a, an impact on other parts yes. of the, the system. So I agree mm -hmm. entirely with okay. what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. And that might also be the case where one's <clears throat> looking at if there's a reduction in churn, that there's savings elsewhere, mm -hmm. because it might be possible after that evaluation exercise to say, well, actually, this procedure has produced savings elsewhere, mm -hmm. which we can't envisage at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, anybody else? No, I don't think the Law Society had a great deal to say with regard to the finances, other than obviously the general principles we made about resourcing and mm -hmm. our, our keenness for this to be a phased uh, impact. And I'd also, I think, uh, Kenny made the point earlier on that this has to be new funding. If, if you take it from somewhere else within the criminal justice system, then you're going to have imbalances there. Uh, and, and that's going to, to have a, a different set of, of problems uh, for us all. As regards to the defence, obviously, the, the, the Legal Aid Board and others will have to be alert to if there is a change in procedure and we require to have to, to do certain things at an earlier stage in proceedings, then that may have to be looked at to make sure that funding is properly in place for that to take place. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to leave it at that. 
bargain agreement. I think, like any financial memorandum, there's a degree of projection mm -hmm. uh, and estimation of, of time and, and how much that would cost. And so, um, an important element of the phased review, as I mentioned earlier, and as I think you've mentioned yourself, is that there's an ongoing evaluation mm -hmm. um, to see whether, in fact, what we have projected is, is adequately or effectively meeting the requirement of the rollout to next phases. Mm -hmm. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I'm conscious of time, so if you could maybe just answer very briefly this question as to whether you're in favour of the Barnhouse system of children given evidence um, or Child's House, um, such as is used in Scandinavian countries, a more holistic way of kids to give evidence. Can you maybe say if you support, support this or not? Well, it's difficult to answer that very quickly, but uh, in, in general, it, 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 it's certainly something that we, we should be looking at, I think, as a, as a potential future model, but it's a, such a departure from how we currently conduct investigations and, and subsequent court proceedings uh, that it would require a, you know, it's an, a, a long-term vision rather than something that I think we could look at just now. Thank you. Yes, very much supportive of that uh, procedure uh, concept. And I think what this just highlights is that we are all still learning about how to do these very difficult cases. And uh, every opportunity should be considered for change if it's going to help. Thank so you. So very much in support of Thank that. You. Law Society, we would never close our minds off to any suggestion. However, we have quite a lot of packages of changes that have already been implemented. We're now considering another one. I think all we want is let's just take our time and assess things and then move on once we've got all the information about what's in existence mm -hmm. and what's new on the horizon before moving on to other elements. Okay, thank you. It's not an issue that we've considered, but having said that, I can't think of any reason why we would have a problem with it. Okay. Thank you. There's just one final question that I'd like to pose. It's in two parts, really. Communication has been mentioned by previous witnesses as being absolutely crucial throughout the whole process. Um, so I wondered your views on that, and maybe more specifically, um, uh, cases where perhaps the vulnerable witnesses, is all about vulnerable witnesses, have been encouraged to give evidence and have done that only to find the trial they were expecting to happen doesn't take place because the accused has pleaded to a lesser charge and they've been totally unaware of that until they arrive at the court doors. So obviously there's a communication issue there. And then more generally, if having encouraged these um, vulnerable witnesses to come forward in what very serious cases and there has been a conviction, if there is a repercussion as they're very frequently can be um, with people in a position of power, whether the bill should be looking at extending measures beyond the support for the vulnerable witness, giving the evidence and the pre-recording to looking at what happens after conviction and still ensuring that support is in place. Would anyone like to, to start with that? Nobody's. Oh, yeah. yeah, me first again. Um, yeah, in terms of communication, you know, there, there are undoubtedly examples of cases which the committee will be aware of where things haven't been as well communicated as they ought to be. Um, we're, we're constantly striving to improve that and, and recognise that communication is key. Similarly, the inspector report focused on that as well. Again, one of the recommendations about increasing the frequency of contact with victims and witnesses. So that's something that we're, we're implementing and, and trying to improve on. Plea negotiation, I could be here all day, so I, I don't want to, to go down that line too much unless you want more detail on it, but it's obviously something which, which parties look at with a view to, to trying to, to resolve proceedings in the best interest. Because it's just the communication that I appreciate can sure. happen very late. So uh -huh. part, part of the problem is that sometimes that can be at the 11th hour and sometimes mm -hmm. even the 12th and 13th hour, uh, and, but it's still imperative that we should be communicating that appropriately mm -hmm. and in the right manner and at the right time. Um, subject to the circumstances to victims and witnesses. So insofar as there have been examples where that hasn't happened, I would welcome the opportunity to look at those and see what we can do to learn from them. It shouldn't, work, shouldn't be that way. Um, and the support? So, so the, the support is, to an extent, out with the remit of the Crown Office and Procurator mm -hmm. Fiscal Service, with the Prosecution Service, and at the point where, where the case um, is concluded, whilst we offer support to victims and witnesses through the court process, uh, I think it's for other agencies to, to be looking at that, offering that support in the okay. post-trial period. Um, Dorothy? 
Uh, communication with the victim of crime and the necessary port support to be given to victim of crime is key to the success of the criminal justice process in these particular cases. A communication is the crime's responsibility from the, st the stage at which the case is reported to Crown Office and I don't feel in a position that I can comment on what they do or do not do in that regard. Uh, support after conviction or support after there's been an acquittal, one can see readily that that would be another issue that should be looked at and if it's provided I'm sure that would be welcomed by victims who feel that they've gone through the process successfully or indeed have been let down by the process. But through all of this, key to a successful outcome, including a successful outcome in trial, is communication with the victim and support. Support including when they're giving their evidence in court, before and after. Okay, thank you. Gracie. From the Law Society's perspective, I don't think there's very much that I would add. I don't know that this is necessarily something we gave a great deal of thought to, your know, attention to in our, our response. I'm quite happy for the, the, the Crown to... I can see where communication with their witnesses is, is very important. I think it has to be made clear what type of communication we're talking about, um, understanding the process, explaining to them what's happening and why, not going into the ins and outs of a witness's evidence. Sometimes witnesses feel that that's what the Crown should be doing with them, and that's obviously something that's quite improper, and the Crown are alert to that. Sometimes witnesses do have expectations that they will receive certain types of information that they in fact cannot receive. But with regard to being kept abreast of the proceedings and, and why there are delays, then I can understand why that's very stressful and that should be avoided at all costs. Okay. And Ewan? Well, the area of communication with victim, victims and witnesses, um, as it's being discussed here, it's not really something with which we have any involvement. Again, I, I don't think there's anything I can usefully add. Okay, thank you very much. That's been a very worthwhile evidence session. Um, can I now suspend and have a five minute conference break?
I welcome our second panel, Detective Chief Inspector Graham Lanigan, Public Protection Specialist, Crime Division, Police Scotland, and Kate Rocks, Head of Public uh, Protection and Children's Services, East Renfrewshire Health and Social Care Partnership, re representing Social Work Scotland. Um, and I thank the witnesses uh, again for uh, written submissions, which we find so helpful in advance of um, hearing from you in person. Um, we now move to questions, starting with Fulton. Uh, thanks very much, uh, much convener, and good morning, panel. I just want to start with a, a, a very uh, general question. Um, uh, if both panellists feel there's um, a problem with, with vulnerable witnesses and children, obviously, uh, in particular, um, having to explain events um, to police and social work, and uh, maybe reflecting specifically in the, the joint investigative interviews um, and the, the, the concept that these might take place over several occasions and over a long period of time? I suppose I, I want the panel to be aware. I, I don't want any misconceptions about joint investigative interviews. Usually they happen at the point that an incident arises for a child. So it's usually incident specific and certainly police and social work would plan that investigation together. And actually, the starting point for social work would be to ensuring about or, or to assess where the risk currently lies for the child and to make sure that that safety plan is in place. Um, obviously, we try to minimise the amount of interviews as possible. Graham will probably say that, and I don't want to speak for Police Scotland, but actually the whole purpose of the joint investigation is for also police to establish whether any uh, um, crime has been um, committed towards that child. So we come from different approaches at the very beginning to establish the facts and what's happened to that child. I suppose that um, some of the learning that we've had over the years about GIII is that we need to do it better and it needs to be much more trauma informed and certainly myself and Leslie Bowl are the co-leads of the new GIII um, training programme and um, we're in the process of developing what that GII will look like in the future, that we're more likely to recognise the trauma of children from the very outset. So we do see an opportunity to see improvements in the system, but GII in the main is used for children where there has been identified as a child protection issue, or where that child may not be the victim of a child protection, but might be associated as a witness. So, for example, it may be their sibling that that child protection issue has occurred and we have to interview the other children to establish whether they are also at risk or any other crime has been, from the police's perspective, has been committed against them. So it is quite a different starting point for social work and I know that there has been lots of reference around GII in the previous um, submissions of witnesses so I felt that it was really important for the committee to be clear about what the purpose is for GII. Okay. GII um, from a policing perspective um, stems from the interagency referral discussions where we've identified these children, where it would be beneficial, where they have a joint interview both between police and social work. How many times and the length of, of time for these interviews varies, and they should be based on the child, the planning and preparation that goes into these, and indeed the, the, the consideration that we're having during the, the, the new training product should absolutely be trauma-informed and child-focused. So rather than to suit the needs of the police or the judiciary or social work, these should really be focused on the child. Um, I, I, I'm really keen not to um, step on my, my colleagues' toes if there is a question that they're uh, looking at later. So I was wondering if, if perhaps you could um, think about um, the, the issues that might be around for... Um, because I, I heard Kate Rock's answer there and, and your, your own, Graham, as well, that it's, it's very specific and it, it, it's planned um, on each individual basis. But can you perhaps go into a bit more detail where there may be, for example, communication difficulties? 
for the child and they may uh, require use of a communication aid um, to, to discuss and how the pre-recording of evidence um, could work on those occasions. I think communication specialists are something that we use on occasion. Uh, the traditional training that we've had for JII up to date has been a five-day course. And I think, as you can understand, that in no way trains people uh, in terms of communication specialism. We have colleagues in speech and language who can help us, and we also use specialists from within the UK, um, such as the National Crime Agency, when we can link them with specialist interview advisors, to try and point us as interviewers in the planning stage so that we can get the best information from the child in a way that suits them. The current course in no way means that those particular police officers or social workers are communication specialists. We do have to work together with our partners in a way to plan that interview bespoke to that child. I would agree with what Graham was saying. Excellent. Um, to avoid the risk of um, covering any other areas, can be, I'm happy to leave it at that, but it has okay. just dawned on me, and I apologise in advance, I should have declared a, an interest at the start of the, the first panel. Um, as my, um, I'm a registered social worker with the okay. C. You've done so now. Thank so you. It's duly on record. <laughs> Daniel. Um, I'd, I'd uh, like to, in, in many ways, follow directly on from that. But I think one of the, the key principles of why we're looking at this is, um, um, one, in terms of uh, providing a, a, a good environment for, for uh, children giving evidence, but also it's about, I think, trying to reduce the, 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 the length of time at which evidence is taken. And we've also heard that the JII is, can be a very useful tool in terms of doing that because it can be admitted as evidence in chief and therefore avoid uh, the need for duplication of uh, children giving evidence uh, through the, the, the court uh, hearing it, itself. Um, or, or as the court case proceeds itself. I'm just wondering what insights you could provide in terms of how uh, the JII has uh, been improved so that, that the quality of the evidence that's there uh, 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 has, you know, can be improved so that it, it avoids that duplication of, of, of evidence? I think the, um, just to make you aware, I'm involved in the, the new JII training product. So I'm working with key individuals within police and social work to further develop that. First and foremost, in terms of the training, we're looking at a trauma-informed approach. We're looking at learning some of the, the, the skills and specialisms from within speech and language. And just to say at the outset, the current uh, training looks to be going from where we are as five days to up towards a year's worth of training. So that shows you the difference that we're trying to make. When we thereafter look at um, age, development and communication abilities, we then tie the training down to essential elements of crime, looking at all the topics we would wish to cover um, in order to test the evidence, and then looking at, once we've identified which areas we want to cover, how do we best introduce that to the child? What's the phrases we use? What's the question types we use? Because we appreciate we have to get all the information to try and test and probe that evidence to get that high evidential standard that you're looking at, but do that in a child-centred way, which is legally sound, compliant, but also understood equally by the child. And these are some of the core values that we're trying to instill in the new training product. I was just wondering if actually you might be able to provide just some evidence of the sorts of things, just in terms of altering the questions or the, the nature of questions, just to ensure that that it does have that high kind of evidential standard? I mean, most people have heard of things like leading questions or double negatives, etc. However, the new training product um, also looks towards the NICHD model, which is internationally acclaimed and has research backing. And, and this is a way of, once we've identified the topics, there's actually a phased process or a framework we can work through to try and use the best open questions, the best questions that would suit the child in terms of their needs, communication skills, and then try and allow the child to interpret and give their best information as best they can. Um, in terms of questioning, the less spoken by the interviewer and more by the child for me is always beneficial. So close questions as an example, we should just really try and encourage that child to provide their evidence as best they can. That's very helpful. I was wondering if you could also just uh, tell the committee to, to, to how that's going to be kind of measured and, and uh, um, 
and, and kind of evaluate it and just in terms of ensuring that actually it, it's doing what it's intended to in, in terms of providing that higher quality of evidence and indeed uh, kind of essentially uh, preempting the need for, for additional questioning or interviews to take place later on in the process? I think there are several processes in that. I think one is self-evaluation after the interview is finished by the interviewers. I think there is also feedback required from the court process if any particular line of questions being objected to and also peer review as well. So in terms of the, the model going forward, it will be subject to rigorous scrutiny by the individual, by peers, by supervisors, managers, interview advisors, by the courts and all fed back in a 360 feedback to uh, increase uh, the quality. And again, by looking at you highly trained officers, using them more frequently, uh, this would all lead to a better product. So there's a formal feedback from the courts to, to the police? Well, that's something we wish to build on right. further. Uh, we've worked with COPFS and SCTS during the, the training, and really we want to build that in because sometimes there can be a disconnect between what actually happens at court and that coming back to the original interviewers to inform practice. Kate Rocks, I was just wondering, from a social work perspective, what your, your views were on, on some of those questions. Uh, um, obviously, the, the whole self-evaluation process or the evaluation process is really, really important to ensure the standard. I think as where we stand currently, um, children's and families social workers, if you look at my local authority, every single social worker in my local authority is trained in GII. The chances are that they may well, in, a, in a, a year, might conduct three or four GIIs. So actually what we know is that we need small cadres of social workers and police officers that become highly skilled at this piece of work. This is a very, very complex area for social workers and police. We have to get it right. We have to get it right to ensure that the child gets justice. So the standard of the VRI or the GII, dependent on how it's done, is really, really at the nub of getting justice and ensuring that the child isn't traumatised through any kind of legal process. So we see the importance of GII and what it can achieve more longer term and um, no doubt the committee will probably be wanting to know a wee bit about our views about that. But interestingly enough, it has to be evaluated and it needs to be done rigorously. And I think that we've came to a conclusion um, uh, from Social Work Scotland and as a Chief Social Work Officer, which I am also, is that not every social worker uh, that works in children's and families may well have the skill set to do GIIs. So we need to make sure that we get the right social workers and the right police officers, because it isn't not necessarily just about social work. There is a sp sp particular skill about communicating with children that actually that you may well be good at providing the support for a family, but actually being able to make sure that you effectively communicate to get underneath what has happened to that child is a skill in itself and it will take time for us. We're, the system needs to improve and we, we've recognised that. We welcomed Lady Dorian's report. Police and social work got together very quickly afterwards and said this is an opportunity to, for us to do something differently in terms of the evidence and procedure review. So actually we feel that evaluation of it and high, that high threshold test is really important around making sure that it's effective moving forward. On in this specific point. Yeah. Um, it's for the Chief Inspector, um, uh, Mr Lundigan there. Um, I understand that you'll, you'll have highly trained people and it's gratifying to hear the level of cooperation and detail that's gone into that. I'm trying to think of a situation, and Ms Rox has touched on it, that all social workers will have GII training, but if someone's dis disclosed, I mean, it's extremely unlikely they're going to disclose to someone who's trained to this level. You're going to have an officer or officers who are going to respond, perhaps, to disclosure. Is there going to be any input into every officer's training so that there's nothing that we've done that might inadvertently prejudice some further. That, I think that's absolutely right. And I think um, through the, the in-depth research that we've done, 
uh, in terms of the new GII programme and the trauma-informed approach, I definitely think there's training that would need to be rolled out to everyone because as we move forward to um, a smaller cadre of officers doing much more planning prior to the GII, this, this does introduce a gap where we would need the initial attending officers or social workers to ask a certain amount of questions to decide what to do. But those questions can't be leading. They have to be asked in the appropriate way to get the most information in, in a way which is not traumatising to that child. So my answer is yes, I do think there's a need for further training. Um, and I think a lot of the research we've done in this project would be viable and would be able to be used for that purpose. OK, thank you very much. Daniel. That's one final question. I was quite interested by your, your comment there um, about uh, the need to create small cadres of, of kind of specialist uh, social workers, and indeed I think the implication was specialist police officers as well. I mean, w w can I just tease that out a little bit? What, what's the sort of your conclusion from that? Is that within local authorities, or are you talking about specialist teams that, that, that maybe... Uh, you know, go beyond local authority areas because the, 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 the kind of the specialism is that, uh, or, or the, the requirement is there. And, and likewise, I'd, I'd be interested to put the same uh, question to the police. And you know, this is this is kind of beyond kind of the division. Is this sort of a, a specialist function that's required? So, Kate Locks first. I would like to just um, not necessarily contradict myself because actually, what we want is social workers that are trained to a higher level. OK, um, because the danger is if you create specialist social workers, you create a single point of failure for a system. So you actually have to ensure that you have got succession planning and how you deliver GIIs, because you never know what you're going to get in in a day and for a busy social work team. Um, for larger local authorities we've had this discussion there's more likely that the critical mass and getting that expertise in the bigger cities like Glasgow City is more likely than East Renfrewshire so actually social workers will be much more exposed and might have a, a higher um, more experience in, um, of undertaking GIIs. So actually it would be for up to local authorities to, to decide how they would organise that, working on the principle that the training is quite different. It's not five days, it's up to nearly a year as Graham um, had already outlined. So we've got a bit of work to do across the 32 local authorities about how we structure that. I can only talk from my own area because it is very small and I don't have the volume that the cities have within or the more urban areas. Um, and actually, it's more likely that I would have to get into a shared arrangement with um, my neighbour and local authorities to actually ensure that we have that the number of... Um, highly trained social workers to undertake GIIs because it would so a more shared service approach would probably have to be taken to ensure that but for bigger local authorities like Glasgow they are more likely to have that experience because just of the mass that the critical mass that they deal with on a daily basis I hope that answers well, that's your question. very helpful and, and likewise from the police perspective I mean how Specialist is this? Is this a central re resource to do JIIs? Very difficult to say that acronym. Uh, or, or is this something embedded at, at kind of local division level? What, what, what's the sort of degree of specialism that this requires? I think for police officers, it, it's, it's more simple because we can take a specialism and react uh, throughout boundary areas. The, the challenge for this one is it's a joint interview, so therefore we, ha we have to do that with our colleagues in social work. So from a police perspective, it's easy to put the right resources in the right place with a specialist skill set, but we we'll have to match them with social work. And again, not to draw particular to one area, but again, it's, it's easy to say smaller cadres used more often, but where you have geographical issues, for example, in the Highlands and Islands, we, we really need to work closely with them to ensure because uh, you may have to fly to an island, you may have to get a ferry, there might not be flights, there may not even be police officers on some islands, so we actually have to link closely and to make a model that would work just as well in a city centre, but equally services everyone throughout Scotland to the same standard. Okay. Thank you. Rona?
fruit in the base. Small yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually on this point. I, I, it's just pick, picking up on the last answer there from Graham Lanigan. Um, the, I know that in the La in Lanarkshire, for example, there's a family protection unit provide the officers uh, for uh, the, the joint investigative interviews. Is that a model that's mainly replicated across the country or uh, is it different in different places? Again, just as I've alluded to, and probably the, the, the more built up areas, the more populated areas, that, that would be the case. But however, as I've mentioned, with some of the areas maybe in the north or the south where they don't have that cadre of specialist detective investigators, you actually have to look, well, what's beneficial for the child? Is it beneficial to wait for two, three, four hours, even a day for one of those officers? Or if they have locally trained officers who have the skill set, but we need to balance that with how often those skills are used. So there's not an easy answer to that question. I think what we'll have to get is the right people with the right skills at the right place to, in the best interest of that child. Rona. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yes, I wonder if I could have your view on the proposal to restrict um, the application at this stage to the most serious cases and going to the High Court. I, I think that's absolutely the way to go. I think there comes a point when people realise we need to do better, and I think there's an anticipation we want to do that now. However, uh, when we previously heard some evidence from the bill team, they looked towards down south and said, well, how, how did it work there? And the information that came back was, don't go too fast too soon. Roll out in a certain area, learn the lessons from that. What's the capability? What's the capacity? And then take it from there. So in terms of Police Scotland's response, I think a phased approach is exactly the way to go. Thank you. Kate? Um, Social Work Scotland would support that position mm -hmm. as well. Do you think there should be anything in the bill which um, states that, you know, that this will happen, um, albeit with maybe a caveat, but rather than have to go back to maybe primary legislation, if it was to be extended after a period of time, do you think there should be something in the bill just now which, which would allow us to, 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 you know, to expand it without having to, you know, go through much more uh, legislation? I, I I think there, flexibility in legislation is, uh, is really helpful. But I, obviously, I think we need to look at what the learning is as we move forward, because this is a significant cultural change in terms of how we want and a system change. And it will take time. And for it to be effective, we need to look at the learning and ensure that we are also evaluating the impact of what it is in children. And I was interested to hear what um, the, the advocate was saying earlier on and the Law Society. We don't know enough about the impact of special measures as it stands and how effective that has been, because we have never asked the questions. So that would be my plea to the committee to ask the questions. Okay, thank you. Mr Lanigan. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I think um, flexibility, as Kate said, is key. I think um, the goal, the vision moving forward is for all vulnerable witnesses to be able to give their evidence in this manner. We're fully supportive of that, but just cognizant of the fact that resources, finance, we have to learn lessons as, as we go. So again, I just go back to commending the phased approach and learning lessons as we go. Thank you. Jenny? Thank you, um, I'd just like to, to revisit some of the evidence we heard at last week's committee um, from the children's charities with regard to uh, children's experience of the system as it currently stands. And one of the charities told us about a child witness who had to give 27 statements to the police. That obviously impacts upon the quality of evidence and also re-traumatises potentially the witness. So I'd like to perhaps hear Graeme Lanigan's views on that from a police perspective. You know, should there be a cap, for example, on the number of times the police are able to speak to a child witness? I, I heard that evidence and I, I don't know that case, so I, I can't speak about an individual case. Um, I was somewhat surprised at that and I would say that that's not normal circumstances. Um, I've, I've never heard of that before. However, what I would say is if you have a very protracted uh, child sexual exploitation case, which that may well have been, Actually, when, when you say a statement, it might not have been a statement, it could have been a contact, but in answer to your direct, direct question, I don't think there should be a cap per se on it. I think we should 
planner interviews, focus on that child. If, for example, a child has such a medical difficulty that they can only spend five minutes at a time being asked questions, then I could envisage that. But these are extreme circumstances and I don't anticipate that to be a normal case. OK, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to move on then to, to perhaps look in a, in a bit more detail at the, the training that the Police and Social Work Scotland are now, you know, it's being revised at the moment. And I was quite heartened to hear some of the terminology um, that you spoke about in your, in your uh, question to Filson McGregor at the start of this session. So you spoke about being trauma-informed, child-focused, all of that is, is great to hear. But there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between that end of the system, the police and social work side, and then the court system itself. Were the courts at all or the Crown Office involved in revising the training, can I ask? We have a, a policy officer from COPFS embedded uh, within the training. We're well represented across the sectors. In fact, it was one of the things we went out of our way to do at the start. So we actually have uh, the, the, the team developing the training. We're supported by NHS. We have a reference group. Uh, we also have governance groups. So we're widely represented throughout the sector to ensure that there is a cohesive response um, you know, right through the third, third sector, Children's First. Uh, I would have to say that the, the training has been well supported throughout Scotland. Yes, absolutely. And it also includes SCRA, which is really important because of the civil threshold. Because what we hope is that, that whatever the, the evidence is taken in chief or by commission or whatever we determine it, it can be used for the civil proceedings in terms of proof. So it's very important to involve SCRA within these discussions. So we feel that we have had really high level of buy-in and in good representation. I think that one of the things that we were really, um, we wish to happen is that new national trauma framework, actually that NES has been involved in helping us to develop the first module, for example, because it needs to be consistent with the national trauma framework. So it becomes part and parcel of the culture of Scotland and not something that is sitting out in the margins um, for children. So um, we, we have had really good buy-in from partners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Liam McArthur. I um, just want to take you on to a couple of areas where we've, I think, had fairly strong support for um, the way things are, are working, but questions maybe about whether or not the bill should be going further. The first, in, in relation to ground rules hearings, there was some concern that perhaps the detail uh, about uh, what, was, what should be involved in, in those hearings wasn't perhaps as ex explicit as it might be, whether or not that needs to be reflected in the bill. I was wondering whether either of you had a, a strong view as to whether or not you felt there was a, a common understanding and, and, and things were working well, or whether or not it would benefit from um, additional detail being um, placed within the bill. Yeah, I'm fully supportive of ground rules hearing. It's not something that the, the police um, are involved in. However, from the early stages of meeting a victim or, or, or witness, we actually begin to build up a picture of them. So I would suggest that information gleaned right from the start could be advantageous to a judge or sheriff in a ground rules hearing. Uh, and I know that Kate may also wish to add to that as, as well. Um, yes, we aren't involved in ground, um, ground rules hearing. And in some respects, a lot of these children are known to us. So actually, we feel that there's probably um, an opportunity for us to help the ground rules hearing to establish um, how best to support that child and take in evidence. Um, so actually generally supportive of the ground rules. In a sense, you both indicated the way in which you get involved in a process, you're not directly involved. At the moment, is that happening routinely enough? Would, would it, as I say, would it benefit from a greater clarification about where appropriate that sort of input, either from a police perspective, from a social work perspective, um, could and should be um, factored in or, or, or sought? Yeah, I think as we put in our written submission, that there is, uh, since 2014, Police Scotland have been involved in witness strategies uh, for the High Court in terms of um, victims of, of rape. So I think that the learning from there could come across and transcend into the ground rules hearing. And again, just to reiterate, <coughs> excuse me, when, when we have 
information and you have a relationship built up through planning and preparation and indeed the officers who may well, if it's a GII we're talking about, all of that information about how they communicate and their needs should be passed across into that. So do we do that as well as we could do just now? I don't think so, but I think in the future we have to. Would that be the same? Uh, I, I think that I think communication I heard earlier on has been an issue. Social work might not actually know that that child is uh, approaching going to trial, even though that we aren't notified by the Crown Office. So there is an assumption in the system that we would know that that child would be given evidence and that isn't always the case because there's no automatic notification to local authorities around the child. So when previous witnesses were, were um, touching on um, Lady Dorian's uh, report and, and, and some of the, the, the fleshing out, I suppose, that she provided in terms of the way that um, th th this process should work, but, but from what you're saying, there's necessarily been a change in terms of the way in which police and social work input um, has altered as a result of that? No, because we need to be notified. We are relying on parents telling us or someone, a third party telling us. As I say, the information lies with the Crown Office and there's no automatic notification to social work. That's helpful. Uh, just um, going on to the issue of intermediaries, again, um, I think in, in your written submission, um, Police Scotland were, were, were very supportive of the, the benefit that expertise can have in terms of, uh, of facilitating the communications, making that, that expert assessment. Again, we heard that from the faculty in the, in the previous evidence session, although other witnesses were perhaps a little bit more um, not sceptical, but, but I think raised uh, concerns about um, the, the quality of that intermediary uh, I involvement. I was wondering whether, um, from a Police Scotland perspective, there was a, there was a feeling that having the intermediary role, um, again, set out within the legislation may be, may be beneficial. I would think it's hugely beneficial. I've been fortunate to work for a, a UK, UK policing agency where I came into contact with intermediaries and actually the, the, the department who deploy them and facilitate them. And I would have to say, as, as a previous on-call resource for supplying intermediaries, I've found them to be hugely beneficial. And that takes you right from, uh, as an independent communication specialist, to the pre-planning of the interview, to through that process, right through to the court. And I know that the demand for registered intermediaries is growing, uh, and it would seem that the, the, these particular specialisms are used and sought after in England and Wales, and, and I think there would be a huge advantage in Scotland. I mean, the, the, I think, the, uh, from recollection, the, the, the Law Society were, were um, I think, comparing it with some of the issues they believe have arisen in relation to appropriate uh, adult involvement for other uh, adult uh, vulnerable witnesses and suggesting that the, the consistency of, of, of the input hasn't necessarily been as high as... Uh, as, as would have been um, hoped for. But from your experience of, of working alongside intermediaries in terms of England and Wales, you, you haven't seen a, a similar issue arising there, I take it. I think where you have particular difficulties, you might have a minimal amount of people with that specialist skill set. So that's why we have to get the best people to help. Um, you know, some children have really bespoke communication issues, and that's why we need the specialist. Even um, with the best wishes, with a year's training, you're still not going to get that level of specialism that you may require on occasion. And that's why I think intermediaries, that independent communication specialist, um, on occasion can be worth its weight. And what, who would be the kind of arbiter of where that intermediary was, was required? Who, who makes that, that judgment? Well, I think the intermediary, before it gets to the court process, right at that interview stage, as a senior investigating officer, if I had a case with a child with significant challenges in terms of communication, I would be requesting the possibility of an intermediary to get involved right from the start, at the, for example, at a GII. So that information would then pass right through towards COPFS, right through to the court process. So from my point of view, the earlier you get a communication specialist on board is the beneficial to the whole judicial process. Do you see that then running through any um, uh, hearings thereafter? Um, uh, the same individuals ideally would, would, would Th that's remain... That's my experience about how that works. 
from a social work perspective on what's... I, I, we can't really comment on it because we don't know, understand enough about the intermediary system. And reading the previous evidence submission, it sounds as if it's an effective way to go. Again, it's about who commissions that intermediary um, and actually what is the purpose of the intermediary, even when it comes down to the GII. What we knew when we, we looked at the GII training is that there was a need for more speech and language and communication input. And actually, if you look at what, where that sits nationally, we haven't got huge expertise nationally for forensic speech and language therapists out there. Um, they're commonly found down south, more um, less in, in Scotland. There is some, but not a lot. So I would be keen to understand who that intermediary would be and what kind of qualifications that they would hold. Intermediaries, I think, are, much, are, are different from the appropriate adults. Um, scheme. Um, the appropriate adult scheme, uh, I, I would imagine that uh, how it's operated across the board, um, it, you don't necessarily have to be a professional that's highly trained to be an appropriate adult. It's just having an understanding of ensuring that the communication within an interview for an appropriate adult is in keeping with that adult's understanding and, and checking and sense checking. So I, I don't think that appropriate adults and intermediaries are the same thing. I think they're quite different from what I've read in the previous submissions. The, 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 the criteria that we need to apply would be the level of expertise, um, which would almost seem self-evident, but also a concern that we have the capacity um, to, to, to deliver that in terms of the, the, um, uh, the quantity of people that have that, that expertise. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, convener. Um, you've talked in response to various of the questions about support uh, or improved communications, improved training throughout the process uh, when dealing with vulnerable witnesses. Is there any area that you can think of where the support for the vulnerable witness through the process can be improved? Is there anything you want the committee to take on board? I think that um, there, are, there are children out there that are, have been involved in the care system that actually have given um, evidence and actually that local authorities or social work aren't aware of, education isn't aware of. So the, if you look at the GIFEC approach, actually if you've got a child that is um, given evidence, you would want the professionals or the team around the child to know that that child is given evidence and to help to support that child and not relying just on the Crown Office to kind of put in arrangements. The other issue that we have is the length of time that it can take for children to give evidence and the memory of the child about that and the recall. And um, for particularly for solemn proceedings, it can take a long time for a child to give evidence. And these children are usually traumatised about whether what's happened. They may be a, a victim, but they may be a witness, and generally um, a witness of a quite a significant domestic abuse case, and how that impacts on them, and they have their own trauma. So these are the things that we have to consider, because actually what children need is help as quickly as possible. And sometimes the court system is counterintuitive to um, providing that level of early help. So that is necessarily, that's the bits that we think that it needs to be, the system needs to be speedier for children. In relation to that, if we assume that the length of time will uh, continue, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, in some cases, uh, what you say more help is needed, what does that help look like specifically? Uh, and, and secondly, you talked about the education authorities, the local authorities perhaps not being made aware. That surprises me in the sense that it seems fairly obvious that all of the agencies that are relevant should be aware. What, is there a barrier to that happening? And is it a data protection issue, for example? No, I, I don't. I think it's just something that happens. I think that there's assumptions made that local authorities know. 
Um, actually, you're relying on information coming from Crown Office to yourself. They may not know that um, social work is involved. We might have been involved at the very outset. Um, it might have been a GII, but the child might not be known to us anymore because there isn't any care and protection issues because the risk has been removed. Um, but there will always be a named person or there will always be someone in education that actually are, are universal services that know that child. I suppose we just need to, it's inconsistent. It may well happen, but it certainly, um, I, I did check that out before I came here. And I did check it out that even assist aren't always notified with children that they, who they support. Actually, um, they have to become reliant on the parents to advise them themselves or for third parties. So, Aware of any particular barrier to, no, to no, that happening? I, no, 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 not uh, any barrier, no. Mr Lanigan, before I ask another question, is there anything you want to say in relation to this? No, nothing I can add to, to what Kate said. Okay, can you help the committee with um, something we were talking about earlier, post-process support? So we've talked a lot about the support for a vulnerable witness going through the process. Can you help us understand what happens after the process to the vulnerable witness? Uh, and in any event, what should happen, what could happen, what would you like to see happen? I think that I believe that there should be a, a, an automatic entitlement for um, children to get recovery services for what has happened nationally. The picture is really inconsistent. It depends on the professionals that are involved with that child. And that's working in the presumption of, I kind of take my first point, that there is professionals involved and have known what has happened to that child as well. Because obviously the whole court process is that it's, it's something that happens in secret and that's the experience of children, that they can't talk about it, they're not allowed to talk about it, the professionals are really anxious about talking it to them because it might be subject to subduracy and etc. So it's clouded in a level of secrecy and what we know is that children's um, recovery needs to happen quickly and then to be given the opportunity to speak as quickly as possible. To say then that uh, uh, after, after a process, a vulnerable witness may have some form of support, but it, a lot depends on where they might be, which professionals have been involved, and there's no standardisation. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, that's right. right. Thank you. If I could put that question to you, Mr Lanigan. Um, have you been aware that after um, someone has given evidence and there's been a conviction, it's been a vulnerable witness like that, you or the police have been called out and aware uh, of circumstances, repercussions, and when you look into the, the circumstances, it dates back to that vulnerable witness having the courage to come forward. Now, obviously, if we're encouraging this, this is something we would like to know about. I can't give you specific examples, but what I would say is if someone goes through a court process and, and, and it doesn't work for them and it's unhelpful, I'm sure that's an inhibitor to coming forward again. And, I, and I'm sure they would actually tell those people round about them how unfortunate that had been for them. So any advancement that we can make, any way we can make this process better, any way we can assist recovery, for me, is hugely beneficial from a policing perspective because it's then not an inhibitor to giving evidence, which we absolutely rely on. Um, I suppose we're looking at encouraging people to come forward in these very serious cases and um, even with the conviction, the people that are convicted can be in a position of power and influence even after convicted. So... Should there be provisions in the bill to look at any possible re-victimisation as a direct consequence of having the courage to come come forward and give these uh, and give this evidence? I wouldn't be against that at all. I think people who come forward and report what's happened to them are very brave. Uh, uh, we. It's, it's, a, it's a real challenge for them to go through the court process for anyone, never mind a vulnerable uh, individual. So anything we can do to enhance that, I would be hugely supportive of. Yeah. 
Right, and Kate, I, we would agree and we would actually ask the committee to consider where that sits with the new domestic abuse bill because actually for children they are going to be the victims of coercive control as well as the, 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 the mother or the father, whatever, I don't want to be gender specific, but actually that will be an issue and that the, the anxiety around that whole element of coercive control and where it sits. Um, particularly after a, a, a kind of whether a conviction's been successful or not, is going to be an issue for that child, and possibly the wider family. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel and then John. Yes, I just had a supplementary following on from what both Liam, uh, both the Liams indeed were asking um, about the ground rules hearing and the support extended to witnesses. And now last week we heard. Um, from the panel, uh, kind of the view that there needs to be a sort of a, a, almost a sort of single point of contact guiding the child through. And we've just heard from 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 yourself about kind of the lack of notification, but the support, I think, but by dint of that, that could be you know, provided by social work. And if you just look at the grand rules hearings uh, and the provisions in the bill, it provides the commissioner with the, the ability to consider appropriate uh, support. Um, in terms of a supporter and also consider whether there are steps reasonably to be taken to enable the vulnerable witness to participate more effectively in the proceedings. I'm just wondering whether or not actually those considerations should be much more proactive uh, and actually maybe perhaps should uh, be asking on the Commissioner to ensure that, that information is provided and ensure that support is is in place, rather than it sort of being a, a negative, a more a more positive duty on the ground rules, and, and that might, in turn, I think, uh, lead them to consider contacting, uh, whether it, it be social services or indeed other parties and organisations that may be involved in the child's life that may be able to help them with that process. Do you think that that might be something that's worth considering, uh, putting into the the, the the ground rules hearings and and what's in the bill? I would agree. Um, it needs to be done in a much more assertive way, as opposed to be something that is something that you can decide, perhaps, or maybe not. And I think I want to kind of raise, not all children that will go through this process will be known to social work. Um, and But actually, we should work on the basis that they have an entitlement to a, a supporter. Thank you. Inspector Lanigan, you talked about a witness strategy. Um, is that something that is at the moment extended to the people we are talking about who would be covered by the legislation? No, not specifically to, to, to children, uh, as, as are the, the legislation, uh, as the list says. It's not. It's specific to those high tariff sexual offences, which are, are going to the High Court. Now, it's not a perfect situation, but I think that the reason I mentioned that is because all information that comes forward would be hugely beneficial and that takes you right from that initial police involvement right through to, you know, we're talking about ground rules hearings there. So actually, if we ha the greater knowledge we have about that individual allows the strategies to be put into place and thereafter specific plans and actions for that individ individual to make that judicial process uh, more suitable for them. So that's why I mentioned it, because I think there's work to be done from early information gathering to make sure that information flows straight through the process. You have two or three questions from that. Would it be possible to share some information with the, the committee, maybe by letter or something more about the, 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 the strategy? If, if, Absolutely, if indeed I can there's do a that. Document. And it would sound like the, the, there's the potential, perhaps, to extend it to the, the group of people we're talking about. What I'm wondering on is whether um, given the nature of some of the people who are the accused in these, um, who have propensity to extreme levels of violence and intimidation, is a risk assessment form part of that, the, the strategy? Um, I, I couldn't tell you all the details of the strategy, but in terms of, are you talking about potential for the future? For y yes, because I was then going to go on to pick up on the point that the, the convener made, because, you know, a risk doesn't stop with conviction. In fact, the risk could be compounded by conviction. So it was to understand, I mean, I, I think of a particular case I'm involved, uh, that I was involved in assisting someone with, <clears throat> it was a, a community where there, there were extreme levels of violence and that continued after and the police continued to have an involvement and were very, very helpful. Uh, 
in, in circumstances like that, like that I, I think that we have to be involved. I think we have to be aware post-trial, and I think we have to be really alive um, should that person not have gone to prison or been released from prison. The, the repercussions to that witness or victim who stood up uh, and given their evidence, we absolutely have to protect them because if we're seen to do that, that encourages other people to come forward. So I'm fully supportive of looking at risk, fully supportive of supporting all victims and witnesses who are brave enough to report what's happened to them. Thank you. And a, a, a small question to both of you. Are you aware of any reluctance to put in place special measures? Or uh, We've heard previously that sometimes witnesses hadn't been consulted. There was just a presumption we'll put a screen up. Are you aware of it? And, and indeed, would that form part of the witness strategy, Chief Inspector? We're not um, involved at the stage of, of special measures uh, in, in terms of the courtroom. However, I heard early evidence that, that there is no reluctance. I'm not aware of any personally. However, I would be fully supportive of bespoke special measures wh when they're planned uh, in response to the needs of that individual. And, and similar to Police Scotland, we wouldn't be involved in the special measures. And actually, as I've already outlined, sometimes we only become aware of it um, if the parent or a third party advises. And if we know that that is required, we would make contact with the Crown Office if, if that child was on a statutory order to ourselves. Um, but we can't. I can't possibly comment. I wouldn't know. So if, if, if not social work services, who would be supporting a, a, a vulnerable witness in these circumstances? Who is doing that? That's a good question. It may well be that there is third, some third sector involvement. But actually, I think we have to be... Uh, it might be the family or the extended family. Not all vulnerable adults will be supported by professionals. I think there is always a presumption out there that vulnerable um, witnesses are... are our victims have certainly for children it's more likely but for adults perhaps not unless they're involved in services the widens of doubt i wasn't being critical of social work services you can no. only assist if you know yeah uh, absolutely that. and whether there is a kind of reason for our involvement a child being a, 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 a witness to a crime isn't always the reason why social work would become involved. Mm -hmm. And that would be the same for adults as well. Um, our, our business is about ensuring, promoting the welfare and ensuring that the safety of individuals. But um, we do that in a very holistic way. OK, thank you both. Anything else in training that you wanted no, to ask before we move on? Very much. Yeah. OK, Shona. I want to come back to resources. We've touched on resources already and we have a financial memorandum that's quite detailed. It's just really whether you wanted beyond what's in your written evidence uh, to, to put more on the record. Um, Police Scotland, um, you seem to be saying that um, essentially as long as it's a phased approach, you're not overly concerned about resources, but if it went further than is in the bill, then you would have concerns beyond that. Um, is that, generally speaking, your position? Do you feel that the, it adequately resources what is in the bill, albeit this is the first phase? Yes, I, I think the, the, the bill is very specific in that prior evidence can be one of the things mentioned as a, as a written statement. So thereby, for, by the nature of that, that doesn't affair the requirement for more video recorded interviews. However, if further video recorded interviews were required, that would have huge, significant financial implications for the police in terms of facilities, training, um, IT infrastructure, etc. So these are not mentioned in the bill because uh, the prior statement, an option for that, which was included, is written uh, statement. So Police Scotland just wish to put on the record that should the initial narrow scope, which includes written statement, be extended to an inference that there would be far more video recorded interviews, this would have huge implications across Police Scotland. You may have heard, whether you agree with the previous panel, where um, there was a, um, a call for continuing evaluation, if you like, so that we can 
um, have a proper assessment of the, the cost of implementing this bill, but more widely whether there may be savings elsewhere uh, in the system because of this bill, and also what would be required it may help us to identify resources required going forward. Is that something you would agree with? I think um, mention has been made from COPFS that they would benefit in terms of a ground rule hearing if the prior statement was video recorded. However, the requirement for that's not included in the bill. So you'll note that in terms of the financial memorandum, Police Scotland have not put any further additional costs there. However, it's just that balance of if we were to do that, um, would there be savings in terms of the length of commissions, how they would run? So if there is further investment required, uh, th that would really need to be met. However, that could be balanced against savings in the court processes. Okay, uh, Kate Rocks, in your um, uh, the submission from Social Work Scotland, the resource issue seems to centre around the additional training needs, specifically you've mentioned of the legal profession, but also of um, the, the local authorities. Um, social workers, and uh, I think you've mentioned this earlier in your evidence about the training required would be much greater than is currently the case. So is that, does that summarise where your concerns about resources lie or is there anything else in terms of um, that you would want to put on the record and do you recognise the phased approach will help hopefully to make sure that we're uh, going at a pace that resources are matching? Um. Yes, but I would want to take into um, mind what Graham has already said. If there's more reliance in VRIs, there'll be more reliance in social work to provide that VRI. So it's not just an issue for Police Scotland. It will also be an issue for social work. And um, the us as we move forward in terms of various bits of legislation, are all interrelated about how we deliver um, effect of um, interviewing of children, um, whether that is the age of criminal responsibility or actually even this um, this bill. Um, there will be big asks from local authorities and the financial memorandum hasn't included the impact for local authorities at all. Okay, thank you. And Rona. Yes, um, can I ask your views on the Barna House system, please, and if you think it's something we should be moving towards? I think for me, that there, are, there are several things about that. One is uh, the facility, and I think the, the facility, how it appears, um, the, the funding for that, I think, when I, I've, I've not attended personally and been at one, however, I've seen images, photographs, and it's far in advance of the facilities we have in Scotland just now. So in terms of that, facility, I think that would be hugely beneficial. In terms of how the actual interview takes place and we link in with the legal system, I think that the work that we're doing in terms of GII and that product that we're going to have at the end, if we match that with a bespoke facility or facilities throughout Scotland, that would be hugely beneficial, whether it's Badge Barnhouse or not. However, I think investment in facilities is without question and, and required. Thank you. Kate. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the Barnhaus in Iceland and I was very struck with the fact it is about the child and setting the right conditions to get the best evidence for the child in a very, and, and actually some of the, the thought processes, Leslie Bowl and myself, who is uh, Head of Public Protection for Police Scotland, felt that some aspects of the Barnahus had to be uh, applied to the kind of the, the new GII training. The difference of what the, um, the Barnahus brings in Scotland to what we have now is that is an inquisitorial system and we are in an adversarial system. And actually, I was struck with the fact that the children get justice really quickly and about the high level of skill that the interviewers actually have. And that is directed by the judge that's presiding over that actual case within the Barnhaus, because the judge goes to the Barnhaus. Um, so actually, I think it should be our aspiration 
actually as we move forward. We know that the conditions are not as they are for us to do it, but we will strive to make sure that JII, as much as possible, can achieve some of the very good practice that we've seen in Iceland. And can I just say I went there very cynical, um, so I didn't go there. So I was very, very surprised at what I did see. Um, I suppose the environment was fabulous for children. It was something that children, it was just a house, a wee house, that actually that everything was thought of. They, they got juice, they were greeted at the door, they were welcomed, the parent was welcome. Everything about that house was warm. And actually, the conditions that actually we, before a child even gets into a joint investigative interview, are even more important than the actual interview themselves, because that's how we set the conditions um, to ensure that children get the best. They need to feel relaxed. They need to feel that there's something, they feel safe. And everything about Barnhouse did feel safe. It felt safe for me for an adult, never bother being a child. Okay. That's helpful. That's, that's very helpful. We're looking forward to seeing it ourselves, actually, this weekend. Um, before we, we close questioning, could I just clarify one thing, um, Kate? You said that there would be cost implications, most definitely, for social work. Have you had discussions with uh, the Bill team? I know you get criminal justice social work and, um, and probably mainstream social work. Um, uh, have you had any discussions, and is it clear which budget any resources would come from? No, we haven't had any oh, discussions, goodness. actually. And I suppose that when the bill came out, it, we need to be clear about the phased approach and what the implications will be. But actually, if, for example, the, there will be more of a requirement for VRI, there'll be more of a demand on social work and police to do that together, it's really hard to estimate what that would be. So th the purpose of evaluating as we move forward, is probably the right way to do it, to understand the impact. Yeah, because this is actually the financial memorandum that says it's not anticipated that there will be any new costs to local authorities as a result. So A, we need to tease out, is this going to fall on local authorities? Is it going to um, fall on the justice budget? But has it been looked at um, as most definitely a, a, an issue where more resources are going to be put in? And the answer seems to be no. Oh. Right, okay, that's helpful. That concludes our questioning, and we're going to spend for one minute just to allow the witnesses to leave. The next agenda item is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to three UK statutory instruments listed on the agenda. And I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. Before I invite comments from members, the justice clerks have um, looked at these instruments and made a couple of points and observations which um, would be good to highlight to you. So I'm going to pass over to Stephen and he'll explain these um, really two main areas that um, they thought there were issues should, that, that should, we should be aware of. Okay, thank you, Kavina. Yeah, just to update the paper in front of you which said uh, at the point of writing that officials didn't have any particular comments, but subsequent to, to that we've been able to look at things uh, in a little bit more detail. So just a couple of points to, to bring to the attention of the committee. Um, the first is that the committee might want to note that the timescale available for scrutiny of these particular instruments is uh, shorter than the normal 28 days that we have available. And the Scottish Government has said this is due to, uh, and I quote, drafting issues which emerge late. Um, in the case of the statutory instrument on 
institutions and consular protection. Um, the clerks understand that this has meant that Westminster's sifting committee received the statutory instrument before we were notified, which is not the, the normal procedure. Normally, the Scottish Parliament begins its scrutiny before Westminster does, so we thought we'd bring that to your attention. Um, and secondly, just to point out that the two instruments on civil law raise a number of important issues covering child maintenance and civil law regimes for cross-border and commercial courts. And of course, this is a, entirely a matter for the committee, but the committee may wish to ask Scottish Government officials to confirm that there are no substantive differences between what's being proposed here and what was proposed in the Scottish Government's consultation earlier this year on the effect of Brexit on family law. So we just wanted to bring those two issues to your attention. Okay. I certainly think the, the timing one, you know, there may be extenuating circumstances this time, and of course that can happen, but um, I think we'd want to send out a very strong marker that this can't be the norm, especially as we've no idea how many of these statutory instruments we're going to be getting in the, the not-too-distant future. And similarly with the query on the, um, the effect of these, it would be good just to, to get some more, um, some more thoughts on that. But I'd welcome comments from members. John. Yep, a couple of comments, if I may, please. In relation to the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2018, and uh, in our paper, which I think is a public paper, uh, paragraph 21 there, if I read from that, however, in the absence of an agreement between the EU and the UK, the retained EU law will cease to operate reciprocally between the EU member states and the UK. Now, we would all understand that. It then goes on to say the UK alone is not able to legislate to restore that reciprocity and in addition the retained law will came, contain numerous EU exit related deficiencies meaning that it will cease to operate effectively. So I just want to put on record my anger at a situation that means that the quality of law that we are having for our citizens is reduced because of this ridiculous situation with the UK government. Um, if I may also uh, commend and I note what was said by the clerk in relation to immunities paragraph 35 you'll know my aversion to uh, encouraging anyone to be immune from uh, criminal or, or, or civil law in scotland so uh, the removal of anyone from th these uh, immunities is to be welcomed in my opinion so a modest start a long way to go Liam. I simply to echo um, john finney's yeah. comments in terms of um, the uh, the deficiencies this is highlighted we've, we've seen a number of um, these uh, instruments coming forward. I mean, I wouldn't uh, propose uh, abstaining or voting uh, against them, but I think each of them have illustrated in their own way um, the, uh, as John says, the ridiculous position uh, we find ourselves uh, in, which is highly, highly regrettable. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Are, are members um, content that we um, make that point about the timing issue, which I think is crucial as we're going to be, um, we're going to be dealing with a lot of these, and that we seek um, just uh, confirmation that the, the Scottish Government is quite happy that there's no substantive difference um, between what's in the SI and what they're covering and what the Scottish Government had in their own uh, consultation and impact assessment. I wouldn't imagine, uh, I, I wouldn't propose that that stops us approving it um, within the 10 day time limit, um, but just to, to seek assurance that they are quite happy, which I think you said, Stephen, could be done by a phone call more or less. So, subject to that, are we happy to approve? Thank you very much. That concludes um, the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be the 18th of December, when we'll continue our consideration of the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill, and we're set to take further evidence on the management of offenders Scotland Bill, and we now move into private session. I'll hurry along because I know some of you... Will